ठीक है रेडी हो स्टार्ट बोले दो ओके यू कैन स्टार्ट सो गुड मॉर्निंग वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक टूडे अबाउट अ कंप्लीटली डिफरेंट टाइप ऑफ ऑप्टिमाइजेशन एल्गोरिदम इट्स this comes under the population based methods so we so far talked about point based methods where one point moves to another point moves to another point now um we will be talking about now a completely different type yeah okay so uh there are many different methods based on the population concept but uh, we will mainly concentrate initially on the evolutionary optimization so to build up the motivation for why we need to do evolutionary because we see around us lot of optimal solutions around us right uh, and if you look at um what's happening how you know how are they optimal or how are they even even a very efficient algorithm uh, there are principles that are followed by nature and one of the thing that we know is the darwin survival of the fittest principle as a guideline from uh, by which the evolution had taken place over the years um so mainly it's a guided search procedure and there is if you look at in a very macro way um there is a population that moves to another population that moves to another population like that and moving from one population to another uh, there is a number of uh, there are a number of operators that uh, acts on the current population in order to create the new population so there are usually the recombination duplication mutation some of those things so you have an existing population of individuals then they are changed to a different population by some operators that are applied on them uh, and then there is a selection mechanism the good solutions stay and thrive have more copies like them and the bad solutions cannot survive die off so that actually provides the nature the direction for going towards better and better so what i did is i did a very simple experiment to to uh, to convince you that if you have a guidance in such a search procedure you can actually get things very quickly if you don't have any guidance then it's very difficult so what we did in this uh, video that's going on is that on the left side we have uh, so we want to Uh, build this word uh, iitk and by by using four blocks one on top of the other and you are blindfolded so you don't see what you are building but you get a feedback after you built it made all four and you ask for a feedback uh, on the left side we give you a feedback whether it's correct or not one one word yes or no okay it's a binary option so there is not much information not much guidance that we are providing you we're just saying if you've got it correctly or not and on the right side uh i give you some more information like if you've got the first letter correct i will tell you that only first letter is correct or if it the third letter is correct i will say only third is correct okay so if we then start when it starts um you will see that they're starting from the same configuration but the right hand side is much much quicker so they're starting together and you see as you are generating you are freezing the information that on the right side and then in about 40 iterations we can create this four letter word but the random search takes forever we ran up to about 150 iterations and still didn't converge you can compute how much iterations on an average it will take before it converts because there are 26 letters so you can figure out how much it's going to take but um the point i'm trying to make here is that some people think uh that there is nothing like uh, survival of the fittest or the evolution uh but if if there was no guidance in the whole process of evolution uh we would not have been here so far okay since the beginning of the universe okay so the guidance actually narrow down the search space okay and then it helps to get towards better and better solution so this whole process has not converged to the optima this is a problem which is highly multimodal and dynamic all kinds of complexities we talked about is there okay it there is no fixed optima so we haven't we being the humans cannot be said as the the most efficient solution to this problem uh it depends on the environment depends on what other species are there because it's, it's after all a coevolution and then that environment which is changing 
So it's a changing problem, which means an uh, optimization problem that changes with time. That kind of problem we are talking about. So this process of optimization goes on forever, because your problem is changing forever. So nature is solving a much more complex problem that we, than we are solving in design and engineering. But the idea here came about around 60s to some people that, why can't we mimic the whole natural evolutionary process on a computer to solve artificial optimization problems, right? So that's what we're going to talk, be talking about. And the reason what we, we want to do this is because we see around us lots of efficient and optimal solutions. Like, for example, if you take the beehive, okay, the hexagonal shape of beehive is, can be proven as an optimum. For my semester-long optimization course, I actually give this as a little project where you can take any regular polygonal shape, starting from triangle to higher up, and show that uh, if you want to have the weight versus the strength, uh, weight divided by the strength, and you want to do find the minimum solution, that's going to be the hexagonal shape. Okay? It's not octagon, it's not square, it's hexagon. So the question then is, how does B know? Bs know about it, because they don't know mathematics, right? Because for you to solve that, you need to use first order optimality conditions. Okay? By writing down the formulation of the problem, then use the optimality condition, then hexagon turns out to be the optimum. But they don't know all that uh, calculus, right? How do they solve it? Okay, there are other ways of solving optimization problems as well, right? So if you are blindfolded or thinking about only improving, improving, improving from your current solutions, you could do it many different ways. You can go through the gradient route, or you can say, I'm going to look around me, I'm going to perturb myself, what my, what my current solution, I'm going to perturb and whatever solution I find is better than what I am, I'm going to move to it and still part of there and continue to do that, that could be another optimization process without the use of gradient, right? So maybe the natural systems have been doing that, have been experimenting, but then you need few features, few properties of such algorithms before you can call this an optimization algorithm, right? So we are going to look at in a very bare minimum of what is needed uh, from this whole complex evolutionary process. What is the, the basic things, the basic constituents that you need in order for you to construct an algorithm. Similarly, bamboo trees, I mean, why I'm calling these are optimal? Those of you who studied mechanical and civil engineering would know that there is a concept of buckling, right? So if you have long slender member because of a compressive load that buckles, like if I take a paper, so it's, it's a very flimsy thing, right? So if you put a lot of force on both sides towards this and towards that direction if I force, it can take that load. See, it's not tearing at all. I'm putting a lot of force. I have to really put much more force before I can tear it off. Okay, you can come. Let's see. But please try to come in time so that you know we can start in time. Uh, but take the same problem and let's try to do the opposite. Try to put a force in the compressive side. What happens? You see? Little bit of force and it's buckling, right? This is called buckling. It cannot take the load in a in a compressive manner. So in engineering, when people are dealing with long slender members, they always take care of this. This becomes the governing situation uh, or more critical situation. So bamboo trees, they are long and slender, right? So because of their own weight, there is a compressive load. And unless the stiffeners at a range of about one foot, uh, if they were not developed, then on, this, on its own weight, it would have just broken. Okay, so nature has figured that out. And if you ask your mechanical engineering friends, how do you compute? How much would be the length? It depends on the thickness and the length slenderness ratio and the Young's modulus of the, of the material that you have. There is a complicated formula you have to use to figure out whether it's enough or not. This length in which you do these stiffeners is enough or not. Again, how does nature know? It must have experimented in the beginning. and It was all failing. It was not able to get taller, but it wanted to get taller in order to get more sunlight and all that. So it figured out that if I put some stiffeners at every feet, then what happens is my calculation restricts within that feet. So my length becomes only a feet because I provide the stiffener. Now it can have a you know, very thin, um, thin thickness and, and, and grow like that. So all these have not come in one day. Okay? Nature had experimented. And ultimately, what we see now are very close to optimal solutions. But I am not saying they are optimal because it's a problem where optima is changing every time or every day. So nature has to constantly work towards getting better and better. 
Similarly, you know, penguin body is a, is a, is a, is a nice drag reducer. Uh, there are some uh, labs, there are some departments. Uh, I'm not sure if you have uh, anything like that in India, but uh, uh, a department called Bionics, where people there go and observe biology or nature of how a similar problem has been solved in nature. And then they get motivation from it, come back to their lab and design an artificial system. Uh, so there are a lot of such design we see in nature where we have already mimicked that process or there are still a lot of things that can be mimicked. So the whole process is, has some, uh, uh, some kind of efficiency in it, some kind of optimization in it. So if you can learn the whole process, maybe we can come to computer and, and, and make a code out of that. So this thing started many years ago. I will gi I'll give you a rundown of the history of when it started and where it is now. But these are called evolutionary algorithms. And then you, I talked about a little bit of neural nets. So there is a whole uh, literature on artificial neural networks, again, mimicking how our brain works with the networks, how it preserves information. Um, and so neural net is an artificial, artificial neural net is a way to preserve input-output relationships in a network. And then there are fuzzy systems which are ideal for handling uncertain and not so precise information. Okay? So your variables, instead of being a numeric number, you can say my variable is a temperature, and I'm only talking about four or five gradations of that temperature, like very cold, cold, comfortable, hot, very hot, something like that, super hot. So you can just have few such uh, alphabetical or, or verbal way of saying what you mean, and you are not specified any temperature by doing so, but you can do math. So if you say that uh, I have a comfortable temperature and the humidity is not so high, uh, then I can use these two numbers, the comfortable and not so high, and multiply it and get something saying, shall I increase the temperature of the, of the room or not? So how much shall I improve by? So all these fuzzy maths are available, and there is a whole group of people who work in this called fuzzy systems. Okay? And, and in India, we have a big presence of that. In fact, all the three components that I'm talking about uh, have a lot of uh, uh, presence in India and various universities. So people have realized, particularly the work in computer science area, is all the three groups come from their computer science, but in other engineering also people work on. They realize that there is a common thread that uh, fuzzy, of course, has nothing to do with evolutionary, but the, the first two, the neural net and evolutionary algorithms, comes from the biological motivation but fuzzy systems also has a biological connection in the sense that our brain works not with exact numbers, but with such fuzzy numbers. So all these three has some kind of ability to, to create intelligence, ability to solve difficult problems and also create intelligence. So IEEE has recognized this many years ago and called these three groups together as a computational intelligence because everything involves computations. So we call ourselves working in computational intelligence field, CI. CI is the broad umbrella. There are three things, but I mainly concentrate on evolutionary algorithms. Once in a while, we use neural nets and fuzzy as well. Another name for this is soft computing. Okay, this whole computational intelligence is also known as soft computing. I think in India, it's more known as soft computing rather than computational intelligence. Um, so under evolutionary algorithms, there are various, various methods, right? Genetic algorithms, evolution strategy, genetic programming, evolutionary programming. If you look at some of these, it's just you know some juggling of words where the evolution comes in, the programming comes in, but that's really all it is, that you do some programming based on what goes on in evolution, right? But one thing to, sometimes I get questions, sir, I've got a problem, shall I use evolutionary algorithm or shall I use a neural net? That's a stupid question, really, because these, all these are, have different purposes. They are not competing with each other. They are complementary to each other. So neural network is to model something, is to get a modeling between input data and output data. This is the usual way they are done. There is an optimization process inside neural network, but neural network cannot optimize. Evolutionary algorithms are, are used for optimization. That's why we are talking in this course, right? Because it's a course on optimization. I'll not be talking about neural nets here. Fuzzy systems are also not solving optimization problems. It, it's a way to represent your variables, your solutions. So you see, in evolutionary algorithms, we need a model. That's where neural network can come in, can help us. We need variables. 
and if we don't want to have precise definition, like in robotics particularly, you don't care whether the object is 2.35 meter away and 59.3 degrees towards, towards right. You don't care. As long as it towards your right and it's not far away from you, you can do some math. You can just calculate and say, okay, let me go on the left. So that kind of verbal working you could do and the fuzzy systems can help you represent those variables. So fuzzy system is used to represent variables which are uncertain and imprecise. Neural networks can help you do modeling. Once these are done, you have to rely on evolutionary algorithms to optimize the system. So evolutionary algorithm to me comes on the top and when you have modeled something through neural net, that can become your objective function or constraints and in order to model it, all your variables can be fuzzy. Okay, so you see that they are not competing, right? They are all complementary to each other. Now, when you do evolutionary algorithm, you need not have neural net. You need not have fuzzy systems. If you have a crisp definition of the functions like we are giving you 2x1 plus 3x2, that's my objective function, you don't need a neural net. You've already modeled it. So you can use that math objective function and work with evolutionary algorithm. If your variables are not fuzzy, like they are definite, deterministic, like x1 and x2, these are numbers, you don't need fuzzy. But in some problems, you may need them. Okay, so then this provides a framework for you to do this. Okay? A machine learning comes under mostly evolutionary algorithm, but it's a problem that is converted into an optimization problem. So it's a, it's a learning problem. So there could be some neural net, there could be some fuzzy altogether. So all the three may involve, or if you're definition of the problem is very crisp, then you may not have fuzzy, you may not have neural net, you can straightway do evolutionary algorithm. But to me, evolutionary algorithm is needed for any of these tasks because ultimately you need to optimize and come up with an optimal solution or learn what kind of pattern is inside. So you don't want to just get any arbitrary pattern, you want to get a pattern that's mostly common. So anytime you have, I want to maximize or minimize something, you have to think of an optimization method. One of the ways to do is evolutionary, but we talked about classical as well. So evolutionary here can be completely replaced with classical methods like the ones we talked about so far. Uh, but then you lose some of the liberty and the, and the flexibility that they have, but you can use them. The best way to do is use a hybrid, evolutionary and classical altogether. That's the best way to do, but I just wanted to put this uh, three things differently because I get this question often is which one shall I use as if neural net and evolution are competing with each other, but it's not. Yeah. So, so which type of optimizing problem do you need to get to Okay, so we'll get, get to that. First, I need to tell you what is this method. Uh, can neural networks be used as an optimization tool? No, they use it. There are some papers we'll find, mm -hmm. but they are kind of forcing because they know neural net, they are forcing neural net to solve optimization problems. But it has to be certain specific structure. You cannot do a generic optimization with neural network. It is not designed to be an optimization algorithm. It is designed more to store the information about input and output. So a neural net has an input layer, an output layer. So input layer means there are lots of input neurons, and each one can be associated with a particular variable. Output neuron can be associated with each of output. So you have a set of data that has input and output in it. So you want to capture the information of um, if I give another input, I want to get the right output. So you have to train the neural net with the existing input output data and store that information. Where is the question of optimization here? But you can now somehow say these, these outputs are my objective functions, inputs are my variables, and then I do something with the neural net inside so that when I send an input, I not only get the function value, but I get something, it's not an optimum, but I get some optimal behavior of some sort. So that's, in that sense, they have used, but you need to change the neural network concept, the how the neural network training is done. But to me, these are like going around and trying to solve the problem. You are better off using an evolutionary algorithm because that's a direct optimization method, as you will see when we discuss this. Okay, so here is the basic structure of an evolutionary algorithm. First. Uh, you have the, so there are a lot of flexibilities here, okay? First flexibility is you can choose your representation of your variables. So far in the classical method, we have looked at and talked about some numeric and non-numeric variables as well, right? When we talked about materials and all that. And I told you that if you have material, you have to have a code. 
right? So, so it is all numeric if you are doing classical methods. But in evolutionary algorithm, you can also have non-numeric information. So that is what I mean here as solution representation. How are you going to represent your solution for the GA if this is if the genetic algorithm is one of your evolutionary method that you are trying to do, right? So that is an important step. But if all you have are x1, x2, x3, which means they are, these are numeric numbers, then you just use them as numeric numbers. Or I will show you first that you can actually use a binary coded GA. So you can use a binary string to represent them. So representation is a big thing, but it depends on what problem you have, whether you want to represent it in a different way or just use it directly. So you have that option at least, okay? And then you choose an iteration counter. To be fancy, we call it generation. Basically, it is iteration. Counter to be 0 because you are starting our process. Now, the first difference with the classical method, instead of a point, uh, initial random point, you have to supply an initial set of points, which we call as a population. That is why these are population based methods. So, here is a sketch that these black dots could be your initial set of seven points that you have supply, supplied. And this could be x1, x2 space. Okay. Then, usually they are created at random, random, but if you are solving an existing problem and all you are looking for is to improve, the performance, then you can use some commonly known solutions to the problem as your initial set. Then evaluate each of these solutions for computing function value and constraint values. Right? So that is what I mean by evaluate PT, so that you get an idea, is it feasible? If not, then what is the constraint violation? If feasible, what is the objective value? All that information you get from one. So this comes from your problem formulation, because you have the fx and gx, everything worked out. Now that everyone is evaluated, you have an idea which ones are the good ones, which ones are the bad ones, right? Then what you do is check for a termination criteria. So that you need to provide a termination, when to terminate. You have to do that same in the classical method as well, right? If you are not terminating, then do few things. First is use the Darwin survival of the fittest idea. That means choose the better solutions of the population, okay? Let us say these four solutions are better than these three, okay? So what, you, what we simply do is choose these four, or sometimes we make duplicates of them. We don't want to screw up with the population size. So here, there are seven population members. We are going to keep seven members for P dash T, but we may make duplicates of the good ones. If this is the best one, I might make two copies of it. And if this is an average one, or slightly above average, I can give it one copy. And these ones are bad, I can give him zero copies. So that some of these, let's say these two have these three have two copies each, and this one has one copy. So I've got seven. So this is another way of saying the bad ones I have deleted, the good ones I have given more copies. Okay? They are clones, actually. So that's the part of the selection operation. How we do it, I'm going to tell you some specific way of doing it. But there are maybe about 50 different ways you can do this okay, selection. So in the selection process, we have not created anything new, right? Whatever was there. Some of them we have given two copies, some of them one copy, some of them zero copies. Some of them we can even give three copies if we are, if we are confident that's a very good solution. So uh, the selection operator decides that. Next, after you've done that, this P dash T is called the mating pool, okay? Because now two solutions from the P dash T will be taken in pair and crossover operation or, and mutation operations will be applied to that. So this variation operator can be a number of operators over here, which basically says you take these good populations. So P dash T is a much better population than P T, right? Because it doesn't have the bad ones. You are taking them and combining its own members, okay, and creating something new. So this is a creation operation right here in the variation as I'm calling it. Okay? It's the size of P double dash T is also the same size as P T. So these um, open circles can be P double dash T, which is the same size as as this one, seven members I have created. Now sometimes um, there can be the identical one, the P dash, one of the P dash, P T is same as P double dash T. You apply crossover mutation, but nothing has happened to them. So it can be common, but in general they are all different. So now you have got a new population, which is this open circle. Okay? This one we call as an offspring population, and P T is known as a parent population. So parent, and then in one iteration we created offspring. And after you've created the offspring, we need to evaluate them because we need to know how good are these individuals. Again, objective function and constraints are evaluated. Now we've got two times the population size. So we combine them 
and choose the top half of it, the best half. And that's called the survivor operator. Who is going to now survive? So it's an evolutionary process in which there's an overlapping population. The complete parent population is not diminished um, in the next generation. Some people from the parent stays and some new individuals stay. And some new individuals that you've just created, they can be so bad that they get eaten up. They just get deleted. But if you have created something good, it stays. Okay? So for example, uh, these two from the parent can come because they may be very good. And this five maybe you've created, which is also very good. And these two that you have created are not so good, so they can get eliminated. So this could be my new population, which is p t plus 1. Then you increment the counter t plus 1 and go into the loop. Now this set becomes now p t. So you start here, select from it now the better solutions. That becomes your p dash t. Then again, create a new offspring population, evaluate, compare, and this is how it goes. So if everything works well, what you will see is that if you take a representative point of your population, this point is going to approach the optimum. It moves to the optimum. And whatever variance you have, some kind of standard deviation you have of the initial population, you notice that that diminishes as you go towards the optima. So it's a cloud moving towards the optima with a reduced variance. So that's kind of the behavior, dynamic behavior of such a population-based algorithm. Yeah, question. P double dash T. P yeah, I'm going to, P dash T is not offspring. P dash T is just some copies of the P T. P double dash T, you are creating new individual. I'm going to show you how to do that. Exactly the same, clone is exactly the same. So, so as I said, these four, these three may have two copies of them, just two identical copies in P dash T. And this one has one copy, and this has no copies. P double dust is this, this set, this open circle. This is a new thing, completely new thing. So I have to yet to tell you how to create the new individual. I have not told you that. And P, P plus one is the combination of that old yeah. seven one. So you have seven plus seven, 14. You create the top seven. You choose the top seven of it. That becomes your, so it could be that these two are selected from P T and this four, five are selected from P double dust T. And that becomes a new population. After that, you don't differentiate which is what. All of them will become black, and then you follow the procedure. Come back to the loop. Oh, man, I'm telling very simple. I don't know why you, you cannot understand it. How many times do I have to tell? The, the open circles are the new ones. Do you understand new? These are new individual. And these black ones, the solid ones, are old ones. OK? Shall I repeat, or is it OK? All right. OK, so this is the first time you're seeing it. So you may have questions. I understand. But please try to understand my English, OK? I don't think it's too bad, OK? So you need to, you need to follow what I'm saying, all right? Um, OK, so now what happens is, let me be very specific. So this is a very generic algorithm I have provided you. I haven't told you how to do selection. I haven't told you how to do variation. I haven't told you how to do survivor, right? Survivor, I told you that you take the PT and P double dash T and choose the top half. But some people also don't do it this way I said. Some people may not always choose the top half. OK, there are some reasons. But, but I don't recommend you to do anything other than that at this point. OK, so keep that. So all I need to tell you is what is the selection operator and what is some variation operators? and how to represent solutions. These are the things I haven't told you. Initialize again, I mentioned you could do randomly, or you could do based on the problem information. OK, let's now be very specific. And I try to give you one complete algorithm, which is, which is the way the whole genetic algorithm started back in 1962 okay, by John Holland. I will give you a, a bit more historical rundown of the whole, whole field. But right now, it's, it's, it's good for you to know Professor John Holland, uh, unfortunately, just expired last year. But uh, he had an illustrious career. In 1962, around that time, he thought of this algorithm, uh, thinking of biology and evolution. And he was trying to solve uh, some cellular automata problem. Remember, in early 60s, I mean, obviously, you were not born at that time. But um, uh, the cellular automata was a big thing. Computer science was just on the horizon. And people were trying to do finite state automaton. 
and he was one of the champions in this. So, he was stuck that he wanted a methodology to create new automata. Okay? So, he was looking for ways to do it, but wanted to keep it very independent. Then he hit up on this idea of using uh, evolutionary way of doing it. So, he gave it a name called genetic algorithm. Um, and then a lot of stuff have been done since, uh, since his time, uh, but some of these we are going to talk about as we go along. But let us first stay with what he envisioned as, 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 as one evolutionary method. Actually, he never said the word evolutionary in his book or any of his papers. Evolutionary word came only in about 91. 1991, so long time after he started talking about all this. All right, so I'm going to take a because it's an engineering course. So I'm going to take a engineering example to explain to you what happens. So let's say this this old can design problem that I introduced on in the first class. Okay, we have a diameter, we have a height. These are the two variables, right? Um, and I have a cost function which I showed you also, the circumferential area plus the two lead, right? Okay, so if you give me any D and H, I can plug it in here and I can give you the cost value. Okay, there is a volume constraint that the volume inside should be at least V. Okay, so V I have to specify, let us say 330 milliliter. So find what is the optimal D and H, that is the problem. And we want to use evolutionary methods to solve it, let us say. And we have decided to use binary coded GA. So as soon as you have decided to binary coded GA, the first step I told you, the solution representation every variable has to be represented in bits. Okay, so, that is that's how the name binary comes in. Okay. I mean that is how he envisioned. So, we are starting with this. Hardly anybody use binary coded GS anymore. Okay. There are reasons for it. I will tell you later. But let us stay with this very simple idea. Okay. So, it is a binary string. Okay. So, let us say I have got 5 bits I want to put for representing diameter, 5 bits I want to put for representing height. Okay? All right. So, when I have 5 bits, so this is particularly one string, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, one particular binary string. Can you tell me any other 5 bit string? Yeah. How many such strings are there when you have 5 bits? 32. Right? So, each place there can be 0 or 1. So, there are actually 5 positions. So, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, 2 to the power 5 or 32 different strings possible. Okay, e every string like this can be decoded. Have you studied all this before in some introduction to computing kind of course? Okay, so what is the decoded value of this if this is the least significant and this is the most significant? 8, why is that? Because this is 2 to the power 0 weight, this one has 2 to the power 1, 2 to the power 2, 2 to the power 3 and that is the only one that is 1 and 2 to the power 4. So, 1 times 2 to the 3 that means 8. Is it okay with everybody with this or do I have to explain further? No? It is fine? Okay. So, if I use 5 bit strings, what will be the 0, 0, 0, 0 bit decoded to? St string decodes, decodes to? All zeros. It will be 0. And all 1s? 31. 31. Okay. So, 0 to 31 and every integer I will have a corresponding string. That is how you get 32 different strings, right? Okay. So, as soon as I have decided 5 bits, I only have 32 options for that diameter. Now, the decoded value is an integer between 0 to 31, but maybe you can tell me, no, sir, I, the diameter I want to go from 2, two centimeter to 10 centimeter, not 0 centimeter to 31 centimeter. That means, I need to do some mapping now from my decoded value down to a variable value. So, let us talk about that first. Here is that mapping function. So, you have the decoded value of the string. So, S is that string. So, for that particular string, we found the decoded value to be 8, right? Let us say A is 2 and B is 5. So, 5 minus 2, 3 divided by 2 to the 5, L is 5, this is the string length. So, 3 by 31, 3 by 31 into 8 plus 2 that will be the value of whatever that string represents. And you will be absolutely sure that no matter any of this 32 string you take, it will always lie between A and B. Let me prove that. So, the lowest value of decoded value is what? 0, when the string is all zeros. So, if you put 0 here, this whole term drops. So, you have x equal to A. 
So all the zero string maps to A. Let's look at all ones. All ones, what is the decoded value? 31. 31. And this is 31, right? They cancel. I have A plus B minus A. What is that? B. So one extreme is mapped to the lower bound, all zero string, and all one string, which is the other extreme, maps to the upper bound, which is B. Any other string will be mapped in between because the decoded value will be between 0 and 31. And so we'll have always value between A and B, right? And all these strings, if you go one to the next B string, you will just go to the next point in that 32 points that you have. Is that right? And the gap between any two of them is equal, no matter where you go. So this is called uniform mapping. So this is a linear mapping with respect to S, or decoded value of S with X. Is that clear? Now, 32 may not be too many, right? For the diameter, you may want to have 1,000 options. Okay, so how many bits are you going to use? How do you compute that? 10. I mean, that's because the next highest number is 1,024. 2 to the power 10 is 1,024. But, but how can you compute that? If I tell you that I want a precision of x, which would be, let's say, two decimal places of accuracy. So that means the difference between the two consecutive strings representing the decoded values should be 0 0.01. Okay? And if you go from one string to its next, what is the change in the decoded value? One, right? The two neighboring strings have got a decoded value difference of one. Is that okay? Everybody with me? Here? Okay. So you have a value of one here. So when you go from one to the other, how much is the change in x? When I go from one string to its next string, okay, x also I am moving from this point to the next point on the x. So what is the difference between these two x? Can you tell from here? B minus A over 2 to the L minus 1. This quantity, right? This quantity. Because when you go by 1 here, this is the one you are adding, right? So this becomes then the precision in the x. So now if you want two decimal places of accuracy, you are going to set this to be 0 0.01. You know your lower bound and upper bound. You can back calculate how much should be the L. Clear? Absolutely? OK, I think I have an example here. Say x goes between 2 to 10. That's my lower and upper bound. I have decided to use 5 bit. So that's the information I was giving you. 10 minus 2, 8, divided by 2 to the 5 minus 1, 31. So 8 by 31 times. That's the mapping. So here I'm showing you if you have an arbitrary s, which is decoded value 11, because 1 plus 2, 3, 3 plus 8, 11, right? So if I substitute 11 here, I get the value of 4.8387. So this string actually represents this real number in my decision space. So I've got a precision. That means if I go to the next one, this is going to be an addition of 0.258, because that is just this quantity. So now if I back calculate and say I want two decimal places of accuracy, this value I want 0 0.01. So what should be the L? So it should be 8 because it's 10 minus 2, 8, divided by 2 to the L minus 1. And if I do some math with it, I find that this comes out to be 9.65, but number of bits has to be an integer. So you go to the next highest one, which is 10. So you need 10 bits to have a precision of 0 0.01 for a x that goes between 2 to 10. You need 10 bits to represent that. If you want three decimal places, this would be much more, right? OK. So this is how to compute the precision. Let me get back to my original slide here. So now I've got a way. So all you have to do now for every diameter, you need a lower bound and an upper bound so that you can map everything in between. Then in a GA, you are actually creating a string. You are not creating these numbers. You are creating these binary strings. And then there is a little piece of code where you will be getting the decoded value and then use that mapping formula using the lower and upper bound and you get the D value. Same thing you do for the diameter. Now you may specify now that I want two decimal places of accuracy. So your code will back calculate how much L you need and that many strings you are going to, that many bits you are going to reserve for D. Similarly for, for height, if you say three decimal places, you can also compute how many bits are needed with the needed precision and you have that many. So if you have five different variables, for every variable, you find out independently how many bits you need 
and then concatenate all of them to get a big string. So here, for example, for two variables, if I need 5 bits for D and 5 bits for H, I have a total 10 bit strings that is fed to the GA. So the whole representation scheme now is that I need 10 bits. So GA will randomly create these bits, 0 or 1, 0 or 1 randomly. How do you create random bits in a computer? There is a rand function, but what is the physical meaning of it? You can actually flip a coin with probability 0.5. So that means you just flip a fair coin. If it turns out head, you put 1. If it turns out tail, you put 0. In a computer, what you do, you create a random number between 0 and 1. If it's more than 0.5, it's 1. If it's less than 0.5, it's 0. 0.5, you can include either direction. Okay? So that's how you can create these bits. And then once the bits are created, you know that first so many bits are for D. And then you use the mapping. Second, so many bits are for H. And you can do the mapping. Okay. So when I've done that, for D and H, I plug it in here. I get the value function value 23. And that's what I'm printing here, saying this is its function value. Well, this particular D and H satisfies the constraint. If it doesn't satisfy the constraint, then we have to somehow penalize it or use some other method, which you are going to talk about. Now, one of the things I want to say here is that why are we doing this? Why did Holland think of a string like that? First thing, of course, he was a computer scientist, right? So bits idea comes naturally to them, OK? But there is another big reason. And that is, this looks like a chromosome, is it not? Because what is in our chromosome? It's made out of genes, OK? Genes are, again, made out of a lot of stuff. But if you just been a macro, a chromosome is a concatenation lot of genes. Each gene is responsible for some feature in us, OK? Your gene controls, some genes of, of you controls how, how much height you are going to have, what should be the color of your eyes and hair and everything, right? So um, what if that gene is somehow changed during the process? It gets mutated or somehow it's changed. Then your eye color will look different, right? So there is a genotypic change that can cause a phenotypic change in you. Phenotypic means how you look like. Genotypic is in the gene level that you can't see, but that's what's causing the phenotypic changes, right? So there's a lot of biology in it from the chromosome to all the way what we look like, OK? Say, do I have a similar meaning here, OK, by calling them as, a, as, as an artificial chromosome? So first thing you notice is if I call the whole thing a chromosome, there are, I can say that there are 10 genes. Each of them is a gene, OK? Each gene here can take two values. Like in eye color, there could be lots of lots of gradations, lots of options, more than two. But here, we are restricting only to two options. Either it can be 0 or 1. Okay. Similarly, the next uh, gene can be 0 or 1, such and so and so forth. Now, let's consider one thing. What about I tell you that the first gene here is 0? So what are the possible diameters that you can have? What is the meaning of the first gene being 0? Diameter will be less than 8. That means 0 to 7, right? If there is a 0 here, if there is a 0 here, can you get a 8 at this position? Sorry, can you, can you get, uh, wait a second. Sorry, 15 or less, not 8. Because this is a 32 bit. So 15 or less. So if you have a, if you have a 0 here, you can never get 16 here, or 17 here, or 22 here, right? So it's restricted to half the size of the range that you have. So in some words, if you tell me that the first gene has a value 0, I immediately visualize the can being slim cans, like Coke cans, which are small diameter cans. But you tell me, no, the first bit is a 1. Then you're talking about large diameter cans, like biscuit cans, big ones, right? So this sort of like suddenly we're making the can alive and saying there is one gene that can tell you, are you a slim can or are you a fat can? OK? So that's the kind of meaning from artificial chromosome to what it may look like eventually. So we are making this alive now, OK? But can you do the same thing for this bit? I tell you the second bit, or let's say the last one. Uh, last bit is 0. What does it mean, physically? No, no. It's the even ones. It's the even numbers, like 2. It could be 0, 2, 4, 8, like this. And if that is a 1, that's the odd ones. If some sense, that's also a value that you may care about. So if you're thinking of only 32 options, and you have to have an even-numbered diameter, 
that gene represents that. Whether you get an even or odd, that gene represents that. Now, we could make some meaning, but um, the some ones are very clear, and some other ones are, may not be so important for solving the problem. But every bit has a meaning. Okay? Um, same is true in our genes also. Certain, there are lots of genes in our chromosomes are useless. They are called junk genes. They are not decoding you to anything. They are just there for a long time. For many, many years, uh, biologists didn't know why they are there. But now they, ha now they have a good idea why they are there. That reduces the chance of having little mutations or little crossovers. So they have to have those lot of junk genes we are carrying for many, many generations. Uh, so very similar thing here. Maybe lots of genes here are not so important, but they got to be there. So we see that there are certain similarities in meanings, but obviously we are stretching it from there just to have the meaning that if you represent it in a binary way, it gets closer to what a natural chromosome may look like. All right. Now let's continue with the algorithm and let's see what's going to happen. So we talked about the representation. Generation counter is 0. Then we have to create a set of initial strings. Let's say we have created six population members. Why six? Why not four? Why not eight? This has something to do with how much should be the population size for a particular problem. I will tell you some general thumb rules later on, but this is an area where there is, uh, it's not much of a science. It's actually more of a thumb rule based, comes with experience, but there are some mathematical analysis came from statistics, uh, more from a sampling theory point of view. So there is a bit of science, but we usually go with experience over there. Our general thumb rule is the population size should be in proportion to the number of variables. So if you have more variables, you should use more size, less variable, less size. So let's say we use 6 just for the illustration purpose here. So now I create 10-bit string for each of these 6 solutions at random. So one string, 0, 1, 0, 1, all that, we create at random. Next one, again random. Next one, another random, right? Then I take the first five bits, I get the diameter, second five bits, I get the height, and I show you in a graphical form how they look like. And I also compute what is the volume inside, because that's a constant I have to satisfy. It so happens that out of the six, this four is either have 330 or more volume, so they are feasible. Okay. These two are little special, they don't have 330. I think I use 300 here. They don't have 300 milliliter volume inside. So what I do? I add some artificial cost to the actual fabrication cost. Okay? And this cost is in proportion to how much constraint is violated. So this one is 28 um, milliliter short from 300. So that's the violation of the constraint. I wanted 300 or more, but I got 300 less 28. So I add 28 to this. This one I got 35 milliliter less, so I add 35. But you can use some other scheme. This is like using the penalty function approach, where I have a linear of a bracket operator with a power 1. Okay? So that's the same. And I used r equal to 1 in this case. So it's basically a penalty function approach I'm using. But there I need to, I need to set a r, and I need to show the bracket operator whether to do square or not. So all these issues are there. But later on, I'm going to tell you that we never use this penalty function approach. But for this illustration purposes, because it's easier for me to tell you, how to, how to add these things. So basically, any feasible solution, sorry, I, any feasible solution, I don't add any penalty. Any infeasible solution, I add a penalty in proportion to how much constraint is violated. If I had no violation, I would have had 0 here, right? OK, so the actual fitness, now this is called the fitness now, of this solution is 23. This solution is 11 plus 28, OK? So now I've got the evaluation part done. Now I am checking if I have to terminate. Obviously, I'm starting, so I should not terminate so easily. Now I go and do the selection operation. That's the first thing, right? So how do I do selection? One way to do selection is called tournament selection. Okay. It's like you know you play games, two two teams at a time, and the winner goes goes to, to the goes forward, like that. So what you do is the six solutions you shuffle them in a random fashion, like you shuffle a pack of cards. Just shuffle them in a random fashion. So we don't know which is which. Okay, So they just randomly put. Now you take the top two and look at their fitness value. Remember, we are minimizing the cost or minimizing the surface area. So which one is better? 23. So I keep the 23. Okay. Take the next two. Which one is better? 24. These two, which one is better? 26. 
So, 26 is kept. So, if I have done that process, come to the end of it, I will only have 50 percent of the mating pool size filled up, right. To fill up another 50 percent, what we do? We take this and put in another random fashion. Again, we shuffle it, shuffle that pack of population members. Again, again, we do not know which is compared with against whom, and then take the top two, choose the better one, and so on and so forth, okay. Fill up the rest half. Okay, so is the process understood? We are just pairing them in a random fashion and the better one is kept. We have to do it two times because first time we will get half and second half, second time it will fill up. Fine. Okay, that is a different thing. Do not get hung up with details, okay. Just I, I told you I am going to give you something better here, but this is just a way I have used the penalty function to show you that this solutions, if I used 11, it would have won against any of them, but they are actually invisible. So, that is why I have to make it worse. To make it worse, I have added some number here, so that they are much more than these numbers, okay. So, that is the only precaution I have taken, but later on I will show you a more scientific way of doing it, okay, because I do not like penalty function myself, yeah. Right. It may, it may, because if I have, what if I had all invisible solutions? It could be. Then all you have are invisible solutions. So, we, we treat invisible also. We do not throw them. If they are the only ones available or out of four, six, let us say four of them are invisible, then definitely some invisible will come, but eventually they will die off, okay. But try to understand the whole procedure here, okay. Now, in that process, what have we achieved? I look at it my original population and I see 23 has got two copies here. Is that a magic? Magic or not? Depends on the random how the selection is done. Everybody agrees? Who does not agree? Yeah. So, so, the fact that it has two copies, is it a magic, is it a fluke or it will always happen? 23 is the best solution now in this population. So, it will always happen. So, that is not a magic, that is not a chance. It does not depend on who it who is compared with what. It is the best no matter with whom you compare, it is going to win anyway. So, you are always going to have two copies of your best solution for sure. There it is a 100 percent chance, 100 percent chance it will there, there is no less than 100 percent probability here, right. It is a deterministic event. How about the fact that 44 does not appear here. Also, a deterministic event, right. So, these two extremes are deterministic events. We want to make sure this happens that the best one we never lose. We have got two copies, and the worst one we are going to immediately lose. We want to immediately lose, so we do not have. How about 24 seems to have two copies? Random. Now, it can be depending on with whom it is being compared. Uh, so, if 23 is compared with 24 in any of these things, then one time it will not come. But what is that probability? Uh, if I have 100 members here, 100 population members, what is the chance that the second best will not have one copy, will not have, will have only one copy, not two copies, very, very small chance. It is actually 1 over 99. So, almost uh, 1 percent chance of having that. Yeah, it, there is a very small event probability of that's happening if it's unlucky that both times it's compared with uh, the best one, but that is one by ninety-nine times one by ninety-nine, so it's like one by ten thousand, almost ten thousand. So that's that's unlikely to happen, very very unlikely to happen. So we make sure with probability we are supporting of what we want to do, but many students ask me this question, sir. Why are we doing in this complicated way? Why not we take these three, the top three, and make two copies each? and be done with it, right. So, we take 23 give 2 copies, 24 give 2 copies, 30 give 2 copies, that is it and remove the, the next half. We could do that. That is a deterministic method. Yeah, all these problems are there, but um, one thing, yeah, one thing we do not want to do is deterministic. So, as soon as, that is the problem with the classical method. Somebody thought of steepest descent method that if we go along the negative of the gradient, 
locally speaking, that's the best direction to go. As soon as you have decided that deterministically, there will be some situations where that's a bad decision that you have taken, particularly if you have local optima and global optima. Local information is bad for global. Or it could be a unimodal problem, but currently the local direction takes you in a wrong way or rather circuitous way to get to the global, to the optima. So you may not want to fix your algorithm beforehand. I call them as you are acting like a god in that case. You are deciding what to do at every generation, every iteration. These kinds of methods have stochasticity. Sometimes you can lose even the second best one, both copies. Very small probability though, we want to keep. But there is some chance you can lose it. It could be a good thing if you lose it. Maybe it's a, now you are at a wrong place. So losing the good ones currently may be good for the overall algorithm eventually, right? So we keep this as, these as probabilities. Every event is a probability. But certain things we don't want to fiddle with, like the best one, I don't want to give it any chance. At least two copies I want to keep at every generation. So this mechanism is a nice way you are having good aspects as well as some some stochastic aspects in it. So probabilities are used in all the operators of evolutionary methods, but calculated probabilities, not a random, you cannot say it's a random search. Am I doing a random search here? What would be a random search operator? Can someone tell me if I replace this with a random search operator, what would be that? How would I change this method so it becomes a random search? Yeah, yeah, so if I were here, out of 23 and 30, I would take one at random. In this, I will take one at random. That would be a random search. No, I'm not doing that, right? That way, I don't have any direction. That way, I may not have even 23 any copies. And all the bad copies will be there. I don't want to do that random, OK? But it is, it is not a random search method. As many people look at that we are using random numbers, and they think it's a random search method, OK? But it's not. So what happens is, from this population, we get this population where 23 has two copies, 24 has two copies, and 30 got one copy, 26 got one copy. Out of this is the task of the selection operator. Now is this clear to you that these are not new members. These are some copies of them, more than one, and or one, and some of them have zero copies. Okay, so that's the whole purpose of selection. Nothing new has been created yet. Now we go for creation mechanism. But before you move, is there any other question? One thing I want to say, sometimes we want to give a high selection pressure. This is called the selection pressure, like I've got two copies of 23. What if I wanted to give a little more selection pressure for the best, three copies of 23? How would I change this method? So I want to get eventually three copies of 23. Yeah, so I, I'm being more greedy in that case. So how do I change this operator? No, but then, but then the second best can also have three copies. Yeah, we can what? Mm -hmm. Well, the simple way to change would be instead of two, I take three and keep the best one, right? And then this three keep the best one, then I have to do two more times like that. And then every time 23 will win, so I will have three copies of it. If you want four, you take four at a time. So you can keep on doing it like that, okay? I want to have 1.5 copies. How do I want to do this? What does it mean? If I want to have 1.5 copies of 23, on an average, I want to have 1.5 copies. How do I do this? So one simple way to do is, is have a binary tournament. This is called binary tournament because two are used. But don't ch choose 23 all the time. You choose the better one with a probability 0.75. And 0.25 probability, you choose the worst one. That way, sometimes you'll have one. Sometimes you'll, sometimes you'll take the better one. Sometimes you'll not take the better one. On an average, you'll have 1.5 copies. Okay? We hardly use that, but this uh, is, a, is a flexibility that you have here. OK, now what are the variation operators? OK, now we take from the mating pool two at random, two, point, two solutions at random. Just make sure that they are not the same. They are not the same. Just take two of them at random, so 23 and 26 maybe. Now we go and look at this chromosome, at their string. Okay, 
With 10 bits, I have got nine sites, intermediate sites, right? Uh, to crossover operator, GA does not differentiate that this is diameter, this is a, the whole, whole string to it. GA looks at it as a whole string. And now, you choose one of these nine sites at random. So let's say I have chosen the third site here at random. I could have chosen this site, I could have chosen that site, okay? Now after you've chosen that, it divides the string into two halves, right, two parts. So you now create the first child by taking the left part of the site from first parent and right part from the second parent. So this gets attached to this and I get that. And this gets attached to that and I get this, okay? So that means I've got two new strings. This is a creation mechanism by which you create offspring. And this is exactly how it goes on in natural chromosomes. But it doesn't happen in one point. Actually, in our chromosome, there are multi-point crossovers. This is called a single point crossovers. So you also have multi-point crossover. You could do a two-point crossover. When you do two-point, you'll be choosing two sites. And all the, all the bits that are between the two sites is swapped. And the site remains the same. Okay, so three point, you can continue, four point, you can just keep on doing it, okay? So by that process, you've got something new. You can be lucky like this, right? Or you can be unlucky as well, that you get create something bad. We don't take care whether you are creating good or bad or not, but if you look at the chance of creating better ones, there's a very good chance. Why is that? Yeah, because these are good solutions, came after selection. So they are good, they are at least compared to another solution it turned out to be better. Now why is this better? I don't know. It could be that 0, 1 combination here makes the diameter small in a range close to the optimum. That's why this is better. Why is this better? It could be the height here, these two combination is good. That's why it is better. So now when I have the crossover, I can put both of them into one. This is the only operator in the all optimization algorithm that I know of. Uh, it's unique. It's no other algorithm has this kind of feature that properties of two different solutions can be put into one by this operator. This is the main search operator of evolutionary methods. This provides you the speed at which it approaches the optima. You are taking properties of good solution, combining it into one, and that's your new child, right? But none of this is checked while we are doing. So sometimes we may be not creating very good solutions, but fine. If what happens if you have not created a good solution? You don't have to carry it long. In the next iteration, the selection will screen it out. But what if you have created something good? Now it will get two copies in selection. So it has two such chances to mate, right? So its chance of creating solutions like it are better, getting more and more. That's exactly what goes on in nature. If a species has slight advantage, slight advantage over its peers, it's going to survive a bit longer. It can hide from the predators more time than, than it other peers, so it will not get eaten up. So if it, long, if it survives longer, it can reproduce more like it. And that's the direction in which so fast the evolution has taken place. I don't know why people who don't believe in this, what do they believe in? I mean, obviously in the US, about 30% people don't believe in evolution. And um, they have a different viewpoint, mainly coming from religious beliefs. But it's, it's just that. But then the, if you look at the scientific way of looking at it, it makes perfect sense to me. But then if it's posed to you saying, this process, how can it create as complicated object like I, for example, or anything that you see in us, it's so complicated, just by taking out the bad ones and good ones, can you do all these? Yes, if you give it time, you can, okay? It's not that humans were created in one day, right? It's a lot of iterations trying and all that. But there was a strong guidance for anything better will survive and create like it. So all these are captured in this selection and crossover mirror operator. Okay. I'll come back. Uh, just let me finish this. Next one is after you've created the offsprings, then you need to mutate. Okay? So what you do is take one of those strings that are created after crossover, like for example this one, and you go and perturb a 1 to a 0 or a 0 to a 1, okay? So for example, this one is changed to a 0 suddenly, and then you got another string. Uh, it depends on now a probability called mutation probability, okay? So usually this mutation probability is kept very low. Uh, mutation is a individualistic operator. It doesn't depend on more than one string. 
with just one string, you go with a, so the way it does is called bitwise mutation, where every bit you flip a coin with probability p m, okay. If it turns out true, you, you change it to its complement. If not, move to the next one and create another random number, check with p m and like that you do. So usually we fix the p m in a way so that only one out of the whole string, one bit will get mutated. So you don't want to do too much. If you do with 50 percent mutation, then it's a random search again. So you don't want to get close to the random search. I forgot to mention, this crossover also is done with the probability called PC, crossover probability. And this is usually kept very high, because this is our main operator. So if I keep PC equal to 0.8, that means 80 percent of such pairs will get mutated. 20 percent will not get mutated. So what does, I'm sorry, crossed over. Uh, so what does it mean, not crossover? So you just simply take these two and put it here, like it's just passed on. There is no crossing over done. Yes, same thing will go. 20 percent of the pairs will just go like that. 80 percent, you choose a cross site and change it. Okay, is that clear? Mutation is more like a perturbation. Yeah. So when you change a bit, mostly if it takes place in the least significant bits, you are just slightly changing yourself. You could make it feasible or the other way around. It can make it the other way around as well. Yeah. Can we perform this mutation before crossover? You can. You can do. Uh, either way, it's fine. But don't you don't want to do crossover and mutation before selection, because you want to do selection first so that crossover can take good solutions and exchange information. Right. Uh, so you do crossover on that fifth sample. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then you do, the then you do mutation. Yeah. yeah. But what he's saying, you could do mutation first as well. Then crossover. Then crossover. Mutation is very rare. So if you come between like. Uh, well, one bit per string is getting changed on an average. So it is not rare. Every string is getting mutated. Um, no, you do every every individual, same every iteration. No, no, no. Every sample is changed, and one bit in every sample is on an average changed. So mutation probability is usually one over the number of string length. So if it's one over the number of string length on an average, so if you have ten bits, I will use point one. So on an average, one will get changed. The next string again, one will change like that. You have the question. Right. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there we are not going with a random pair. So no. here we are uh, crossing over right. getting, we go for random. So it's a random site. Again, it's a random number that is used, yeah. but the search is not random because why is not random? If I have these two strings, if it if it were a random search, you could create any other string out of these two strings. Can you create? So you see now, this one has a 0, has a 0, 1, 1. By doing a cross site anywhere else, can you create a, anything other than 0, 1 here? No. So that means you cannot go to lots of strings, which has a 1 here or a 0 here, or both. You cannot go to. But if it were a random search operation, you could have gone from these two strings by crossover anywhere in the search space. As soon as you have these two strings, there is a subset of these 32 solutions that you can, rather 64 solutions here with 10 bits that you can only go to. And that subset is very little, maybe eight or, t eight or 16 strings that you can go to. So, and those strings are supposed to be the better ones because these are obtained by the selection operator. So from the entire search space, selection is saying, now that you have these six solutions I have chosen, this represents only this part of this search space. And by recombination, you are staying in that part. You are not going far away from it. So it's far from being random. No, no, no. It doesn't depend on PC and these two are sep two separate things. First thing is you flip a coin with PC. Let's say your PC is set to be 0.8 and you create a random number between 0 and 1. Say you get 0.35. Since it is less than 0.8, you will perform the crossover. If the random number was 0.92, it's greater than 0.8, so you will not do crossover. You will say, okay, I just send these two to mutation. So 80% of the time you will be doing crossover 
and 20 percent of the time you will not be doing the crossover. After you have decided you will do crossover, then you create another random number between 0 to 9 or 1 to 9 saying which of the site that I am going to do my crossover. So, these two are independent events. So, every pair of crossover is not crossed at the same site. Every time you create a new site and then it is created. Yeah. Okay, we take a 5 minutes break because the tea is waiting outside. The whole thing here is attached to this part. So, this three are attached to this and I got this and this three attached to this and I get this. That is the idea. The right side is swapped between the two. So, you get two new strings. No, no, mating pool is this, is still this. Oh, after you have created the by crossover mutation, after you have created 6, now we have the old 6 like this one, the initially started one and then this new 6, we put them together and choose the better, better 6. Sir, can people change across isolation? Can what? Yeah, you can change them, you can change them, but usually we do not keep, do not change it, we usually keep it fixed, both PC and PM we keep, keep fixed, but you can change it, this is a very flexible algorithm. Sir, say this is my exit solution. Okay, I like this is equal to 80 percent. Right. It means that 6 of this 80 percent will get crossovers and 20 percent will remain. So, how many pairs of crossovers you, you will have when you have 6 population size? There will be 6 members to cross, 2 at a time. Yeah. So, how many? 3 only, 3 pairs. Yeah. So, 80 percent of 3 is how much? Most likely all 3 of them okay. will get through. But if you take a large population like 100 population members, yeah. then there are 50 pairs. 50 crossover is supposed to take place, 80 percent of them will take place. So, 40 of them will take place, 10 of them will not. And mutations will happen all, all the, the 100, yeah, all the 100 solutions. In this case, all 6 solutions after you have done the crossover. Okay. That is why I said uh, that there is a less chance that the solution you had on the parent population is also same as the offspring population because if mutation can change it, although you did not do crossover, but mutation can happen it changes slightly. Sir, so suppose we have 6 or 7 variables and at starting time at what, uh, what is, what may be the population size? Okay. So, I usually do 10 times the number of variables if, if I am starting from a random initial population. So, 10 times 7 would be 70. Yeah. But if I, if you tell me 50, then I do not do 500. I can do 200. So, it is a non-linear, but uh, early on if you have very few solutions, it really depends on so many things. It depends on the problem complexity. If you have a linear problem, quadratic problem, I do not even use 10 times. I can use 2 times or 4 times, that is enough. But if it is a very complex problem, so how do you know it is simple or complex? So, I try with a small population size first. And then if I am not happy with the result, I increase the population size. And I, oh, I see there is an improvement. Then I do one more time. And if I still see improving, I will keep on doing it. But if I do not see there is improvement, then I stop. So, No, those are usually fixed. I usually fix constant 90 percent. PC, all problems. I do not ask my students to change it. It is 90 percent and PM is also 1 by the number of bits. Um, only thing is, I, I do not want to recommend that too much is that, so we had, I told you
OK. All right, so we're starting again. So we looked at a basic structure of a binary coded GA, its operators, and the whole flowchart of how it works, right? Um, selection and the recombination together makes such a search algorithm working. Mutation is helpful because it doesn't allow you to just get stuck somewhere. It can comes and changes a 0 to a 1, 1 to a 0 to provide you the diversity. So that's more of a kind of insurance policy that we have. But the whole idea of selection and recombination is, is actually the recombination aspects of two good things into one, to me, is the main reason why these algorithms work so well. But if you use selection and mutation, you are doing more of a hill climbing. So mutation is doing a local perturbation around your current point. Selection is helping you to choose the best one. And then again, local perturbation, best one. So it's more of a hill climbing. You have a more of a local search property. Without the crossover, you don't have the global search property. Well, there is a little bit of global search property because of the population that you have. But the, the recombination can provide you that global property as well. Uh, but you have a very reliable optimization if you're having all three. So here is a simulation of a two-variable problem. You have seen that problem before, the x1 squared plus x2 minus 11 squared, the same problem I've been taking for classical. I'm starting with 10 points here, two variable, but 10 points I'm starting with randomly. You notice when it starts, points are all over. Some of them are feasible, some of them are infeasible. And then they very quickly decide to become feasible. And then after that, so right up to here, so it's about 30 generations. After that, the whole population have kind of merged, and it's creeping, right? So you can see two parts, two behaviors of the algorithm. First is to locate a good region. After that, it's more of a hill climbing. So at that point, you don't need a GA. When, when all the population have just kind of come together, you can just take the best and use a local search, maybe steepest descent, maybe SQPE or something. So there is a need for GA to start with and finishing up with the classical methods. That kind of hybrid becomes very clear when you observe such a simulation. OK. Now if you look at the differences between classical methods, um, this particular GI I talked to you about works with the coding of variables. So because you're dealing with the coding, I'm actually isolating my problem from the code, from the optimization algorithm, right? Uh, it could be those diameter and height and the cost is for the CAN design problem. The diameter and height can come from a cantilever beam problem or X1, X2 as another problem from fluid mechanics, whatever. It doesn't matter. As long as you provided a cost function and an objective function, uh, a con constraint function, that's it. Because GA is only working with the binary string. It doesn't know what is behind that. So that's how GAs have a more applicability. But that still doesn't say it can solve all problems. So the NFL is still valid here. But at least it has more applicability, right? the same algorithm. So you could now do permutation, continuous, integer that we're talking about, the discrete variables. Everything can be put. It's just because you're using a coding of all that. So numeric, non-numeric, everything can come here in a nice way. I will, I will talk about more later. So that's one aspect of it, one advantage of using these methods. The other is it's population based, right? So there's no one point going to another point, a population moving to another set to another set. So it has a global perspective, right? Because there are safety in numbers, OK? And also, inside a GA, there is an implicit parallelism. Because you're, the whole population is kind of moving together, and you have this crossover mutation that exchanges information between individuals of the population, you have an implicit parallel search. This was actually very nicely shown by John Holland in his 1975 book uh, about the implicit parallelism. Um, all the operators of the GA, like selection, crossover, mutation, everything you've seen that we are using random numbers. So these are stochastic operators. They are not deterministic. Because they're stochastic, we are not, you cannot give me a function and tell me that well, in this function, your GA is already starting in a wrong way because it's a stochastic thing. So you don't know how the numbers are going to come. Okay, uh, So it can take you out of a stuck situation. Or if it's stuck now, you run it again, you may have a different performance because maybe different ways the random number have come. And it, it, it has used a different path. So if you look at a path, like a trajectory, which we look at point by point method, a trajectory goes from starting point to the end point, to the optimum point. Here, 
you can think of every run and if you take the mean of the population as a trajectory, if you run it again, there is another slightly different trajectory, another slightly different trajectory. So, we actually have a stochastic trajectory here. There is a mean line, there will be some variation in it. So, it is very difficult to get stuck. So, there is a lot of advantage of being uh, uh, having a or, or working with a stochastic algorithm like that. Um, we have not talked about gradient in any of these operators, right. So, GAs are actually direct search methods, you do not need gradient. But then if you have gradient available, you can actually use it in the mutation operator or in the crossover or somehow you can use it, right. If you think gradients are available, you can make it flexible or more gradient based if you want and we have done that in some, some occasions. So, overall I think it is a very flexible algorithm. You are free to choose almost anything, but because you are free to choose, there is an onus on you that you have to make everything working together. That is your responsibility. When you are using steepest descent, you are using somebody else's method. So, if it works, you give him credit or you take the credit. If it does not work, you blame that guy <laughs> saying, oh it is a bad algorithm. But here, you are creating the method. So, blame or or whatever it is uh, reward, it is all yours. So, if you are proposing something, you should make sure it is a good one you are proposing. So, people use your method more and more. And, and that one of the reasons why my work has become well cited, if you look at in Google Scholar, most of my work is well cited simply because we make sure that there are, um, it is more closer to science. So, that there is a methodology that works, it makes sense without using any extra parameters. So, people does not have to fiddle with the parameters. That is how it became applicable. That is how when you use it, it works most of the time, right. So, it is hard to do, but if you can do it, uh, then you, you make a dent in the field and so others can use it. The last point about this is parallel implementation is so easy. Let us say you have got uh, 100 processors at your disposal in your lab, okay. How are you going to use GA with 100 population members, okay? So, let us say GA has 100 population size. So, there are 100 individual you have created at random, you have got 100 processors. Each evaluation take 10 minutes, let us say on a one computer. What you do is send each of your members to each of the processors. So, in 10 minutes you have created 100 of them. If you had 50, in 20 minutes you will create all 100 of them, right? If you have one processor, you need 10 minutes times 100, 1000 minutes to do it. But more processors you have, the more population size you can evaluate quickly. So, it is really linearly parallelizable. So, you can get a linear speed up. There will be some time wasted in communicating. So, you may not get exact linear, but up to certain point you can really get a very fast linear speed up. Uh, there are some other ways you can put them. So, you can get sub linear speed up as well, okay. So, these are highly parallelizable algorithms. So, these algorithms are actually congruent to the current time where the, the hardware development has taken place and these softwares, these, uh, these codings, these codes are highly parallelizable. So, you can actually have a good marriage between the two, right. And the classical methods are not because you have just one point to deal with. You cannot take advantage of several processors. So, now I am coming to the question that you are asking, how can you run this for can you use this for discrete or other things? So, here is a situation I showed you before, right? Discreteness can happen. Now, GA is not using gradient, right? So, how will GA solve this problem? Well, if it has to compare this solution with that solution, which one is going to win? This solution, because you are minimizing, so this is better. The discontinuity, does it matter? No, it just does not matter. So, it is not a problem at all, okay. How about such a discrete place, space where there is nothing in between exist? If I use a binary string, so there are 8 options here and I have decided to use 3 bit code, code. so 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I can use these bits, okay. Now, can I create any bit here? No, because 0, 0, 1, the next one is 0, 1, 0, there is no string, no strings in between. So, the way I mapped it is that I am always using one that is allowed. So, there is no way GA by crossover mutation, any way it can create anything other than what you want, what you have. So, you do not have to have branch and bound or any other thing, it is just so natural that you have coded in a way that you can do this, okay. So, the, to GA actually 
in other words, I say it this way, the G A actually you have a continuous space like this, but it is just that it is never going to go to these places, but it looks at this as a continuous function and there is a minima right here, so it will go and find the minima with, with its iterations, right. So it is very, it simplifies a lot of things, right, where in the classical way, because it is so rigid, uh, there is only real parameter the algorithms are developed that for any other thing you have to come up with fix ups. It is no surprise that these kind of methods have been used in many, many applications. Um, I am just showing you a couple of them here. This is Japan's uh, latest bullet train called N700 series. It was designed in 2007. So this nose of this particular train is designed using GA. So I was present at the time they were presenting in a conference. There was a keynote by who, by person who designed it. So he gave the story of, of how he came to know about GA and all that. It was fascinating. Um, he was a classical optimization guy. All along his life, he did classical optimization. First time he faced this problem in Japan, the issue is they're fast trains, right? Very fast goes from one place to the other. These bullet trains, and although it's a small country, but then area-wise. Most of the people live on the coastal areas because inside is very hilly, so nobody can live. So the whole population is on the coastal side. So and they're very very populated, and then high speed streams are going through them. So what they have is tunnels, lots of tunnels. So when at a high speed comes, high speed trains comes goes through the tunnel. What happens? There will be a lot of vibration, noise vibration that will come. Right, a whole bunch of air comes and hits the tunnel, and it kind of um, you know makes a lot of noise and vibration and people are living on top of it in here, so it is noisy. So they, it's a, their cost is not an important objective there. Their most important objective is how to reduce that vibration and noise, okay. So that is the main thing. So all those can be achieved with a long nose of the thing, so that is very smoothly you are entering. Uh, you cannot do this with the trains that we have here, you know, you cannot go at that high speed and make a lot of noise. So what should be the length and how should it be designed and all that, that is a big question, right. So they had a lot of parameters in these nodes they identify as variables and then they would have a model that if it is like, if this is the shape, they will make a finite element model and then run it through, an opti uh, through a simulation software which will tell how much would be the noise and then they try to minimize that, right. So they did, did it with classical methods point by point. And eventually, a solution was suggested by the algorithm. Then they don't trust it, right? Because it's a simulation model. Then what they do? They make an actual model of it and pass it through a wind tunnel test. Okay. So in the wind tunnel, those things were failing the requirement that they had. Now they are using an optimization code. The optimization did its best and gave a solution, and that fails the test. What do you do now? Say you are an engineer trying to design it. What do you do now? You cannot handcraft it, you cannot change because there may be 100 variables here. You do not know what to change here. You will have your rest of your life to figure out if you do one at a time and all that. It is not possible. All you have to do is have a much better algorithm, right. So then someone told them, why do not you try GA? Because they are doing very complex problem solving. So he learned GA and then he used it and he came up with a design which is different, pass it to the wind tunnel and it passes the test. So then he tries to look at why, how is it different and then in the conference he gave very nice presentation of how GS have managed to compromise this with that and so it was a very nice talk really. Uh, but the bottom line is GS has that power. So the way he is presenting it is that the, the classical point based method solution was found was a local optimal. That was the best that the method could do, but that was not satisfying the constraint that they had. But that constraint only comes. It satisfies on the simulation, but when you actually put it on the wind tunnel, it is slightly different. So it is probably in that part of the constraint space where slight variation from this makes you invisible. And what GA is able to find is a much better region, maybe it is more robust, maybe in a place where the invisibilities are far away, so it could do it. Um, so these are, the, uh, these are the success stories that, that I would like to say, this is not the only one. Um, then this Kone's elevator, so if you go to a very high raised building, Kone is by the way the second highest elevator producer. Um, so uh, it is a Finnish company. Um, so what you do in a high raised building is there are multiple cars, right? And then when you go to floor, floor number 5 and press 
button to go down, another guy is on seven going trying to go up or whatever. So you get all that all that calls and then you have to decide, right? Which car will come to you, which car will go to fourth floor and seventh floor and so on and so forth. Okay? And there is one objective is that the people who are inside the car, you are not asking them to stop at every place. People who are waiting, we pressed it, you are not asking them to wait too long. So there are these two waiting time that you want to do. Later on, they came up with a third objective, because I was involved a little bit on that, uh, is that they want to minimize the overall energy consumption. Because you want to keep a car staying where it is as long as you want, because you don't want it to go, go up and down, because that causes energy, costs you energy. Okay? But if you have to, to minimize that, then you will do. So there are certain constraints. So it's, it's a really typical resource allocation type optimization problem. Um, I show you their website. Uh, from their website, I got these, um, not website, their manual of this, is that you see the allocating landing calls using genetic algorithms. And this they did back in 1995. And actually, they have coded them in a chip. So the whole GA is coded in a chip now, where every half a second, okay, all the calls are noted, and a GA is started for that solution with the current situation of the cards. In less than a microsecond, it does the solution and it's implemented and the car goes up and down. Again, another half a second, the calls are taken. So it's a very fast implementation. Nobody is guaranteeing these are optimal because you cannot get in microsecond an optimal solution, but they don't care. They just want a solution that works, right? It has to be feasible. It has to reduce the time as much as possible in that time. So this is how the practice is, then getting to the optimum. Something that works then better than what you have right now, okay? So there are many, many such success stories out there. Some of them they cannot tell because it's proprietary. I'm consulting with some companies. They cannot even use the word evolutionary in their website. Okay, I've been telling them, please do so, because then I thought this will be a publicity for the evolutionary methods. But they said, we don't want to even give a hint to our competitors that we are using GA, <laughs> because then they will get the idea. So, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's a competition out there, and, and whatever you can do can keep that secret. And so many of these things cannot be even talked about in many places. But if somebody is using since 95, 2007, they have actually got the fruit for many, many years. Now they can say that we are using this, we're using that, and, and so on and so forth. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how the whole thing has evolved. Um, as I mentioned, this is John Holland, um, 1962. Around that time, he was working on cellular automata, came up with this idea of evolving new automata using genetic algorithm. Uh, almost at the same time, there is another group of people uh, led by Larry Fogel. He's also, he's also no more. Uh, it's been a while. Um, but he was experimenting with finite state machines, but he was in California. And John was in Michigan, in Ann Arbor, close to where I am. Um, and, and uh, San Diego, in California, Larry Fogel was doing evolutionary programming. It's another way of doing programming, evolving finite state machines. But for a long time, they did not know existence of each other because back those days, emails weren't there, right? Websites weren't there. So the only way to communicate was writing letters and stuff like that. So, or publications in journal, then you happen to read that paper, then only you know. So they came to know each other much, much later. On the other side of Atlantic, in Germany, there are a couple of people. Actually, there's one other person. Ingo Reckenberg, Hans Paul Schoeffel, they were doing experimental evolution. So what that means is all their stuff was experimental. They were not using computer. So they will actually use the evolutionary principles to do in an experimental set, setup. An experimental setup gives them the objective function and it will optimize. They call this as evolution strategy. I will talk about it at some point briefly of what they have done. Around the same time, you see, early 60s, again, nobody knew about them. In fact, this German presence of or work, work of these were not known until about 85, 86, okay, by the, by the Americans. So independently, these three groups started working, started, started using evolution as an optimization tool. Then in 91, well, much before that, about four or five years before that, they were all aware that there were three groups and they were making good contributions then they kind of they have their own little conferences. Then they said, why don't we just get together? Because we're talking about the same thing. So then these three things have been merged, genetic algorithm, evolutionary programming, and evolution strategy. 
because the evolution one the, was the common term in them, they call these methods evolutionary algorithm. And since then, we call it evolutionary algorithm. Okay. After that, genetic programming, particle swarm, all these have come out. Okay. Okay. Some of the major events. So after these early 60s is Ken De Jong is still there in uh, George Mason University in, in, in Washington, D.C. area, in Maryland, actually. Um, he did his PhD with John Holland. First time he used GA for optimization. It was not Holland, but Kenneth De Jong was the first time. He actually compared GA with classical methods like Stipe's descent, Newton's method, and all that on five problems that he de designed, very complex problems. Um, and he showed in all of them GS as advantages. So that's the first time uh, GS was applied for optimization. So his functions were called de Jong's functions for a long time. Uh, people use his method. Then came David Goldberg. Uh, back in 89, he wrote his first book on genetic algorithms in search and optimization and machine learning. It's still a very popular book. It was almost nominated. It was nominated for the best, uh, most. Uh, what is it called? Um, not. Um, it's the it's the most sold copies, bestseller. Bestseller. I was waiting for that. So best-selling book. It was nominated, but a technical book to get the bestseller is very difficult, right? So it just lost to one other very popular book on friction that came out. But imagine that he he went very close to this. So this book has actually made this whole field popular, and he writes so well. If you read his book, it's a treat. I had the Good, very good opportunity to work with him on my master's and PhD. So, uh, unfortunately, he stopped doing research, uh, but he, he stays very close to where I am. So we often meet, and um, so he has given me offer to come to his house and stay for some time. <laughs> so it's very nice of him. Uh, anyway, so he's um, uh, made a lot of contributions in the beginning. Okay, with all these developments that are taken place, this some of these you know, main developments towards optimization, they thought that there should be a conference okay, where people meet and come and talk about. So there was this first international conference of GA in Carnegie Mellon in 85. There were about 40 people, I heard, because I was not there. I was not working in this area then. And then, um, then they decided to have it every other year because of the low attendance and so 87 and 89, 89, I started attending and never missed one after that. Uh, then around that same time, people were complaining more about theory. Theory, does this work? Why does it work? I remember the first paper I presented was back in 90, 1990 in California. I was a student then, so it was a student paper. I applied GA to a welded beam design problem, uh, which has a lot of citations now. But this was a very simple work, four variables. It's a, it's a very typical problem optimization people do, highly nonlinear, and I showed comparable results with classical methods. So there are some people uh, who are asking me, do you have any proof for such uh, methods? And, and when, when I said, well, at that time there was nothing. So then many of them are not interested in listening what I was going to say. So we started with that. I had too much difficulty publishing my first paper on, in a journal. There were lots of questions. It came back and back. But they didn't want to just reject it, because they thought there's something in it. But they wanted to know more. The first question was, is there any proof? Second question was, can you repeat it? So I do a lot of simulations runs and show them. So eventually, that was published. But a um, lot of issues. So we started from that. And people thought we should make some theoretical advancements, much more than what we had before. So these conference called FOGA started, Foundations of GA, still continuing every every even years it goes on, focusing only on theory. In terms of journal, our first journal started by MIT Press in 93. And Ken De Jong was the first uh, editor in chief. And then 97, IEEE picked up and these uh, transactions and evolutionary computation. Both of, both of these journals have very high impact factor. I mean, the one has 3.89. The other was close to 5, but last year suddenly dropped to close to 4. But there was a minor hitch. But I think uh, in the computer science journals, our IEEE ones come second. Okay? Uh, so it's, it's very highly cited and uh, large impact factor. Then these biannual conferences merged because more and more people started to work. 
we are going to have our conference in a uh, couple of conferences in July after I go from here. Um, the the Gecko conference, which is going to be in Denver this year, has about 500 people coming. And CEC conference, I just heard yesterday in the email, it's now called WCCI, or all these three groups come together, Neural Nets, Evolutionary, and Fuzzy, 1,700 attendants. Okay, so you can imagine how popular these fields have become so far. I mean, I go to these conferences, I don't know 90% of the people, okay, after working in this for 25 years or something. Um, so, and then we have uh, societies like IEEE has a society called Computational Intelligence, and ACM, which is another computing society in America, it also has a SIG called, called um, Special Interest Group on Evolutionary uh, Computation, started in 2005. So, we are part of big uh, societies, computing societies, so it's well recognized, but there is still a long way to go, according to me. All right, so the main advantages of these methods is that the population approach, okay? So either you can use the population approach to get one or more solutions, okay? We were currently talking about one solution. Later on, we'll show you how the population can be used to find multiple solutions. Second advantage is the operator flexibility. As I have been telling you, every operator, you could do crossover, mutation before crossover. You can add heuristics, problem information within crossover, within mutation within initialization, so a lot of flexibility is there. And also, like this was the operators can be made flexible and the whole algorithm can be made flexible. That's where the mutation can come early or you can add another operator to this. You know, a lot of things you could do there. So all these flex flexibilities come with the price that I said that the onus is on you, okay? So you have to make this right. So it requires a bit of learning curve, you need to know what what did you do so that it makes sense, so that it would work? And there is a lot of literature to fall back to, to do that. So you cannot just become an expert tomorrow just by knowing the GA today. But you, it's a good thing that it doesn't require too much math. It doesn't require too much other things. Uh, so you can start. And these things, everybody understand how the natural stuff goes on. And it's also interesting. And that's why many um, researchers, this field is attracting and then they, but then you have to study a little bit. You have to know the do's and don'ts because many people before you have done, have been looking at it and come up with some conclusions. Instead of reinventing those wheels, you can maybe know it straight away and then contribute on top of them further, right? Okay, so the customization is a big deal. I'm going to tell you because I already mentioned that the NFL theorem doesn't allow you to have one algorithm good for every problem, which means you have to customize for customization, you need an algorithm that should be flexible. So these algorithms allow you that. So everything kind of logical and falls in place for using these methods in a customized way for different problems. Okay. My experience here, I'm say, telling now, advantages of using this I found is applicable, it's more applicable to problems where no prior good methods or prior applications have worked well. So like I said, you know, you tried that um, linear integer problem I showed you at the end of last class, and I showed you that, well, we need to solve 50,000 variables, but an existing method can do only 1,800. So that means there is a case. So when you had such a thing, then you said, now I'm ready to go for a GA or, or some advanced methods. And these kinds of things happens if your problem is discontinuous, nonlinear, multimodal, all these complexities that often come in practice. But there are some other problems, even for simple problems, they have a roundabout way of solving it, like where multiple solutions are needed. Like you have a multimodal problem, and you want to get multiple solutions simultaneously. Multi-objective problem, where naturally there are more than one solution, and you want to find them. Now, those cases, there is a clear-cut advantage of these methods. So when we get to those, I will highlight. The third advantage to me is there are lots of problems in practice, which are so large-scale, that we, instead of solving the problem as they are, we try to come up with a concept. For example, if I'm doing the robotics problem, okay? So I don't know how the obstacles will come in a real scenario. So I don't want to solve the problem where you have to give me exactly the locations of all the obstacles, and then I give you the optimal path. But rather, I want to come up with an optimal concept of avoiding the obstacles and still go in a time optimal manner from one point to the other. 
what is that optimal brain of the robot? What is that optimal rule base? Or what is that optimal concept that I need so that the robot can achieve it in a minimal time? So instead of finding the exact solution, you find the concept. Another thing in civil engineering is this building, tall building design, right? So if you have in one floor, there may be 50 beams and 100 columns. So every one of them may have two dimensions, the width and width and breadth. Okay, so there could be 100 variables in each floor. If you have it's a 100 floor building you're designing, 100 times 100, so many variables. Okay, so it's a huge problem. And you may be right in 80% of the variables, but in rest 20%, if you have very bad value, then the whole thing is considered bad, right? Uh, so there are a lot of issues when you have large, large dimensional problems. But instead of keeping every variable from every floor in the optimization problem, you say, I'm going to develop a concept. And the concept is this, that I'm going to design 100 variables for my ground floor. All the 100 variables in the ground floor is my variable. And then I have some parameters that says, how am I going to reduce the dimensions as I go up? Because you know that from the technical knowledge of building design is that it's like a cantilever beam, right? So as you go up, your dimensions are going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. We know that it's not going to be bigger than the dimension below. It can be equal or smaller. So I utilize that. Only thing I need to know now, how much smaller it is. Is it 90% when I go from fr ground floor to the first floor and then 90% first floor to the second floor or some other way? So I can just give very few simple variables to say how I'm going to reduce my first floor dimensions to second floor. And I concentrate on finding the first floor dimensions. So this way I reduce my number of variables and I develop a concept of how to solve this. So many a times when variables are large, we try to solve the concept rather than the actual problem. Okay? Again, these kinds of methods come very handy for doing such problems. And I mentioned parallel implementation. So if any of these things you are happening, you're seeing, in your problem that you're trying to solve, you should think of these methods. Okay, I showed you this before. Okay, let's now take, take one or two uh, case studies of what we had done. And um, so first one, I mean, this of course I didn't do. This was done by some other people. This two, two uh, one is a policeman and other is a university professor from Texas, okay? Uh, they did it very, very early on, 91, when GAs were just being worked out. So even real coded GAs were not there. It's only binary coded GAs were available. So their goal was to identify, it's a feature selection problem, basically. So a crime has taken place somewhere, and some people are suspecting the suspect, okay, the criminal, that they have seen from behind or front or whatever. Uh, cameras were not there at that time. So they have to kind of announce that there's some robbery taking place in this house, in this street, has anybody seen any suspicious looking person? And some volunteers come and they are called on one day. There's an artist who is sitting by beside and the policeman was asking questions. They were describing the person one at a time and the artist is making a drawing and they, sometimes they show it. Does it look like him? They said, no, this part is different. So they will, have, they will erase it and draw it and eventually either they get bored or they say, fine, this is the one, okay? So they wanted to make it a bit more scientific. So what they did was they thought of five different aspects of the face, forehead, eyes, nose, mouth, and chin. Okay? And they decided to have seven bit string for each of them. So how many solutions? Two to the seven, which is about, so they wanted about 100 solutions. So they went up to 128. Usually in any police station, they will have lots of criminals photographs. Okay? So they've taken the recent 128 photos of burglaries and all that. And now they construct a 35 bit string because seven bits for every five, one of those five features. So there are total 35. So what they do, they randomly choose one of the one of the person's face from the record, cut the forehead and put it in the template of a face that they're generating. Then look at the next five bits. Let's say that decodes to 35. So they go to the 35th entry and then gets his eyes and put it below the forehead and like that they construct the face, okay? So some features from one criminal, another from another and creates a face, okay? And then it shows, they show it to these people who have seen them. 
and they give a one to nine point scale, they give a mark. Nine means, yeah, yeah exactly this is the guy. Or one means, no, it, it's completely different. So you can give that number. If there are 10 people, so one person is running it on a computer, these 10 numbers come to him, he takes an average and standard deviation and does a mu plus standard deviation, and that becomes the fitness. So here is a problem, which I first read it, I thought, wow, there is no mathematical objective function, right? There is no 2x1 plus 3x2 here, right? It's coming from people giving a number based on what they, what they conceive this person to be, okay? If everybody says good, you'll have a very high number, right? Because he's averaging with the standard deviation. And then he's running a GA and then creating new solutions by single point crossover, which you have just seen, and a bitwise mutation and a selection very similar to what you have just seen and then passed on to them again. And they, so they have to sit few times for some time to do these kinds of number crunching and then eventually they come up with a phase. So here is the one case that they have in the paper where this was the actual criminal that they simulated and this is what was found by that. And you can see that there are a lot of similarity with the eyes, the forehead and stuff like that, okay? So you take from this the idea that GAs are even applicable to problems where there is no apparent objective function. All you have to do, if there is a population of solutions, you have to somehow say which one you like most, which one you don't like most, and so on and so forth. So one guy have used this really nicely, a German guy called Hardy. So I was visiting him in Berlin, and lots of problems he has solved. So one of the thing. Uh, I used to, when I was in India, I used to see that ad. I don't know, they still have this. It's, I think, with Johnson and Nicholson, the paint ad, where there's a lady who saw um, uh, a dancer from South with some color in his head that she liked that color, she wanted to put it on her drawing room, okay? But she cannot describe that color, but she knows that is the color she wants. She, so she goes to the paint store, and she cannot describe, all right? And then she says, wait. And then she goes to these dancing places and drag that fellow and says, this is the color I want, right? So it was, I don't know if it still comes or not. But I thought, wow, that is something that somebody um, has in her mind, something that they want, but they cannot express it, okay? So what is a color represented by? Three numbers, red, green, green and, and blue, right? RGB, so some combinations. So they, you can go from 0 to 255 on each of them. Some combination is going to make a color, right? All you have to do is find out what is those three numbers. So those three are your variable. What should be red? That's x1, green, x2, and, and blue, x3, so that it matches, so error is minimum, what you're thinking. But who can give you that fitness? Because you don't know, as an optimization guy, you don't know what, I don't know what you are thinking. If I'm the optimization guy, only you can tell me. So he came up with a very nice idea based on this kind of simulation that they have seen before. He goes to, he makes an appointment with the lady who wants looking for a color. He goes to the door and he opens his laptop and there are four colors, okay? One is white, the other RGB. And then he asks the lady that which of these colors is closest to what you're thinking. So if it's some kind of bluish tint, he will press the blue, right? Okay, so the, as soon as you have done that, he's running a GA. What is that GA? He takes the, out of the four, the one that she touched, it's the only solution. And it makes four copies of it. All three are deleted. So it's a very high greedy selection pressure, okay? So one, the one that is selected make four copies of it. And then he partners with the mutation. Because with one, everybody same, you cannot do a crossover. Because you'll get the same thing. So he relies on mutation. Because you want a very fast solution. Because he cannot wait there one hour, right? He has to come up with very quickly. So then he does mutation to them, and four new blue stint have come. Because you are mutating on a string that is probably 0, 0, 255, if it is the blue, right? Now you mutate 0, it may one of them become 10, another maybe 5. And this 255 you mutate, it can go down to 240. So you have some blue stint with some red and green in it, right? And then another one, and then another one, the four such things. So you immediately show these four, four different colors, which are all blue. Now the lady has a little bit easier time to touch it and say, well, it's a little more difficult rather than easy, right? Because it's getting closer to what you're thinking. Now you have to split the hair and say which one. So you now touch the one that is closest to your 
And he was telling me in three or four iterations, the lady would jump and say, this is the one I was looking for. And then what he does, he gets the, the combination and gives it to her. Okay, and then with that you can go to paint store and buy. So, and then he asked me, do you like coffee? I said, yes. Okay, so the, he took me to his office and he has a gadget. Uh, copy, the, the milk is coming from this pipe and some sugar is added, getting added automatically. So he asked me to sip like four or five times. Okay, so it's an experiment he's doing. So he gave me one to sip. And again, the same thing, out of four, I said, okay, this is the one I liked. Then he did one more time, and I think in one more time. And then I really liked that coffee that he has. So he then told me, this is the recipe, that your temperature of the water should be so much, so much coffee you should give in one cup, and so much sugar and milk and all that. So if you really, something you like, and you don't like the variation too much, you want to optimize it once and for all, uh, that's, you can use this method. Because these methods do not require gradients or any other thing, no mathematical function, somebody should tell how, how, how are the two solutions different? Is, do you like this more than that or not? Right? So I start with that example. There's a lot of subjective information that you can use here. Uh, again, nobody is looking for an exact optimum for these things, right? Okay, I'll come back to the theory a little later. Um, before I even show you other examples, let me just go straight to the end, okay? And I'll come back to this. Uh, because for today's evening, um, let's say afternoon problem, I need to talk to you about the constraint handling. So I'm really going at the end here. Okay, this one, constraint handling. So this is, I don't know what page, but you come down, how much? What is the page number? 18? 18? No, 15? Okay. So get there. So now, okay, so I, I showed you the basic structure of GA. I showed you at least one example that says, uh, you don't need to have a mathematical function. And I'll show you some more example. But let's get to the constraint handling first. How can you handle constraints? One of the ways you could still do is penalty function. And this is what we discussed, right? You have a bracket operator and then an R, but now you need to fiddle with R <coughs> if you want to really do it properly. And I mentioned you have to normalize your constraints. All that stuff is still valid. So I take that welded beep design problem that I, that I told you, like I, that was my first paper I wanted to I, I, I presented, um, here is the problem, but I'm not giving you the taus and deltas, these are very ugly, no, very nonlinear functions here. It comes from the mechanics. But four variables, you know, objective function is not so difficult, but the constraints are very difficult to handle and there are many of them. Okay, so what I did here, I, f I normalized all the constraints, I added them together with the penalty, with the bracket operator and added to the objective function and I'm treating it like a penalty function approach. So only thing is, instead of using steepest descent, I am using GA, a binary coded GA to solve it. Okay. So I use different R. First, I use a fixed R of 10 to the 0, which is 1. And I run it 50 times, GA. And I, what I find is that, um, so what is this? So I get 13 of the 50 runs. It doesn't give me any feasible solution because my R is too little. So it's not taking the constraint satisfaction very seriously when I have R very small, right? So it gives me infeasible solution after I run GA. But some cases when I got results, feasible results, they're pretty good. The solution for this problem, I know by heart because I, I solved it so many times, it's 2.381, okay? That's the function value supposed to be, minimization problem. I got 2.41, it's pretty good because you can have as high as 483 or 5,000 or something as well. So for that, 2.41 is very close to 2.381, right? 2.381 is the known, that time best known method. Right now, we have proved it that that is really the best. Nobody can beat below that. Um, but, but then look, look at the fluctuation. When I run 50 runs, the best run gave me this. The worst run gave me that. So it's not a reliable method. I cannot suggest you to use that R although I get good results for some of the runs. So such a method will be, you, you only have to try many times expecting that sometimes it will work, okay? But that's not a reliable method. Then I increase R. Now I never get an infeasible solution because R has got enough emphasis. The constraints have got enough emphasis. But look at what happens to the best and the worst. So worst has become good, but then best has sacrificed now. 
Okay, that's the typical scenario. When you increase r, you are giving more importance to constraint satisfaction. You have to sacrifice on your objective function. Like that, when I keep on increasing, they are going away from it. Okay. So, you need to come up with a fine balance, maybe a R between this and this, or maybe between 1 and 1000, I have to do more fine grain to figure out what is a good R. But if the problem changes, you introduce another variable, I need to redo the whole process. So, this was the situation back in early 90s with GA, that the penalty function was the only way. And after this experience, I thought someday we should work on some much better ways of doing constraint handling, because that should not be the way. One of the reasons where constraint stuff did not really advance in our field, in this field, is most of the people in this field are from computer science, and they don't care much about constraint handling, really. I mean, it's only engineers who have to think about constraint handling because constraints always come. So there are not many takers of, the, of this field. So I took a lead on this, and most of my work will have, you know, constraint is a main thing. Uh, so it took me some time after I came back and joined IIT Kanpur with my second master students. I took up this study, and this is what we came up with. Okay, so it's 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 a method that is parameterless. There is no penalty parameter, but it 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 does implement the penalty function approach. See how? So let's say I've got a function which is like this. I have to minimize. So here is my minima, but I come and say there is a constraint. This side is feasible, that side is not. You have seen such a thing before, right, when you're talking about penalty function. But there we are using different R and a sequential method. But what we suggest here is now we have a population, not just one point, right? We have a population. So let's say these are my population members in my decision space. Some of them are feasible, some of them are not. Okay. So I came up with this concept that I have to have, that a feasible solution I should assign a fitness that is better than any infeasible solution, so that feasible solutions are get more emphasis, get more copies than an infeasible solution. Okay? When I'm comparing two feasible solutions, I should make sure that the one having smaller function value is better. I'm thinking of the tournament selection, right? Two are there, I'm comparing and which one to keep. That's where I'm thinking. That's the only place where you have to put the direction and which solutions are better. Now, when I have two infeasible solution, which one should be better? Because both one I cannot recommend, right? But in an algorithm, I still have to provide a dichotomy between the two. So, which one shall I say? The one having, yeah, the one having smaller constraint violation, because I have a way I can compute constraint violation. So, that is that, okay? So, one having smaller one is better, okay? So, this is my goal. So, I could actually go and implement this in a tournament selection. That's what we do. But another way to do this is this. You can actually assign a fitness, then you don't have to change your code. You can use an existing code, but assign a fitness from the objective function and constraint violation. How? First, you have the whole population. You go and identify which population members are feasible. That means all constraints are satisfied, including variable bounds. Okay. Those are called feasible. For those solutions, you immediately assign the fitness same as the objective function value. So, capital F is same as the small f. Small f is the objective function, capital is fitness. Exactly the same. Okay. Now, you look for all those that violates at least one constraint. You compute an aggregate constraint violation. That's this quantity. This quantity. You compute for each of these infeasible solutions. What you now do is go back to these feasible solutions that you have, and you computed the function values, note down the worst function value, f max, worst of the feasible fitness values that you have. That's your f max. Now you go and do simply add f max to the constraint violation value for the infeasible solution. So that becomes their fitness. So what happens here, these are feasible solutions. Their function f and capital F are identical. So if you do it that way, if these two solutions are compared, this is going to win, because that's a, that's a better solution, right? Now, in the infeasible side, what you do is, this is your linear constraint violation. Here it is 0. As you go away, more and more violation, right? Now, what you do when you add f max, so what is f max here out of the three? It is this one. This one has the worst function value for the feasible solutions. You lift this function up by f max. So this one is moved up at f max. 
So, capital F x is discontinuous, it is linearly coming down to the boundary from invisible side and taking this shape here for the feasible side. So, there is a discontinuity here, but I told you G A does not care if it is discontinuous, for G A is not a, any, any difficulty. So, what is that doing now? So, let us see if all of them are satisfied. I told you that between two feasible, the lower function value is better, right, according to this fitness. So, again smaller capital F means better. Now, let us check the first one. A feasible, is it better than an infeasible? Take any of the feasible solutions here and any of the infeasible solution here. Always better. Why? Because I have moved the whole thing up by the worst amount. So, it cannot be that this is better than that. So, I made sure first is true. How about the last one? Because I started with this, this actually ensures that and I just made a linearly moving up. So, this is also valid that this one has a better value than that. So, all the three are satisfied and you then do not have to go and change your code. All you say is from the objective function and constraints, you define this fitness and send it to the selection operator. Is there any parameter you see here? Some student tell me, sir, f max, is f max a parameter? It is not a parameter. It, it comes from wh whoever are the feasible and what is their function value. I would not know beforehand, so it is not a parameter. Um, what if there is no feasible solution? Then you put f max equal to 0. There is nothing f max 0, so and then you are nothing adding there. Okay? So, this is a simple minded method just by thinking how to compare between the two solutions. They can be feasible, infeasible and implement it in a nice way. Okay. This one? Uh, no, no, it does not matter what the g x is, but this is always positive. Okay, this is my constraint here. I am saying feasible means that they are all greater than equal to 0. That is how I am defining feasible, feasibility. My constraint is this. All g should be greater than equal to 0. Okay, that is my constraint. So, that means for, for a x, if all constraints are satisfied, then it is feasible and then capital A is small equal to small f. If any one of them is violated, then you have something positive here. You have to make sure this is positive. This is the constraint violation. So, that means if you have a negative value here, you have to take the positive sign of that and that is your constraint violation. So, for a solution constraint violation, if it is positive, that means it is infeasible. So, you are adding uh, f max to a positive number okay, over here. Okay. Now, here is a simulation when I just change the sign, sign of this thing. Now, the optima moves here and you see the same algorithm with this constraint handling has no difficulty. Previously, when the sign was this side, it was this point was found. Remember, I showed you that thing. I only thing I did is change the sign of the constraint and use this constraint handling method and it just goes there to the right place without having to have any parameter, penalty parameter. Now, this answers one of your question. I think you asked me what is the penalty parameter to choose. You do not need to have any penalty parameter. Let me show you some results of this method. Um, here is a problem. I think I have a sketch of it. Yeah. Um, this is the two variable problem. Can you see from the back two lines here? Is it, is it seen? Two lines? Okay, there are two circles actually with little bit of eccentricity. The, the region inside in between the two circle is feasible. Okay? So, I was presenting in some conference and somebody later on came and say, you must be having a crooked mind mind because you come up with such difficult problems. And I said, could be, but unless we show our algorithms um, work on very difficult problems, how can we say the method is good? If I can show you results on problems, very complex problems that it works, I know for simpler problems it will work. right? And that is one of the ways you should not be happy any time in solving only simpler problem and say, I have got a paper, I can write it out. Because yeah, for those simple problems it worked, but you never showed how it worked it will work in another difficult problem. But if it works on a difficult problem, chances are it will also work on a simpler problem. right? So, you should always think of difficult problems. So, these problems did not exist in the literature. I created it because I wanted to create. So, the feasible region is just inside this. right? It's, can you see these two lines? It is within this the feasible region is. And somewhere here is the minima. So, when I created 40 points at random, 
none of them were inside that region. By random process, you will not create a point in between these two curves. I wanted such a situation. Okay, so this one allowed me to do that, and these are those initial points. And you see, after some generations, how the points get crowded and get inside and eventually get the optimal. Here is what ha what's happening. Uh, this is generation counter. This is the average proportion of population of solutions over multiple runs. Okay, I think 50 runs is what we had. So you see, initially there is no one which is feasible. Now, pretty quickly, in so our last algorithm that we had is this one. Okay. You see, in about five, six generation, I've already got about 10% population members feasible. Then very quickly it rises. Okay? Eventually, in about 30 generations, I have got about 95% to 96% population members feasible. So in 30 generations, every 90% plus solutions have went inside that feasible region. And the optima was found right about, right about, about here, optima was found. So I have some more statistics here to show you. Yeah. So remember 2.381, I said, here is my performance of the algorithm. 50 runs, okay? The best run found 2.381447. The median run found 2.382634. And the worst run found 2.38355. So what this says is all the 50 runs have come within this range. None of them were really out of these. So that means. Um, you don't have to run it 50 times. You can just run it once. At most, you can be as worse as this. The actual solution is 2.381 and some decimal, which is probably this one. Okay? But you are pretty close every time you run it. That's the kind of reliability you need in an algorithm. So every time you run it, it takes you very close to the optima you don't, so that you don't have to run it again. Okay? So this method has all that feature without having any parameter that allows it to go there. It just manipulates the points in a way, feasible being better than infeasible, too feasible, the feasible is better, the, the better function value is better, and too infeasible. The, so what happens is, in such situation, is that if, you, if all you have are infeasible, what happens is there is a slope towards getting feasible. All your solution, all you're doing is your objective function is this now. This one is completely ignored. You see, for infeasible solutions, I don't have the FX computation. I don't even compute FX for infeasible. This is the culprit, actually. This, because this has a minima, as soon as you compute this, you have a tendency to come here, because this has a smaller value. So I said, forget it. I'm not going to compute that at all for infeasible solutions. Only in feasibility I bother about is how far away I am from being feasible. So I have a linear function for that. So all you have is, from the infeasible side, you tend to become feasible very quickly. And once you are in the feasible region, then your objective function starts to play, and then takes you near the optima. Yeah, so uh, we've got many, many other problems to solve with this. This was published in 2000. Now I'm very proud to say this is really the default method that most softwares and people use it. So if you read a paper, they will say we have used, uh, sometimes they put my name, sometimes they don't, but they say penalty parameter less approach. So this is known as penalty parameter less approach. Okay. All right, let me now show you the time I have with some more examples. At least one example I'm going to show you. This one I'm going to start with. Uh, this is a solar thermal power plant design. This problem came to me from a power company from Spain. Okay? So this was about seven, seven years ago now. Yeah. Uh, they wanted to go solar because in Spain there is a lot of sunshine as we have in certain parts of India. We should actually in this country also try to go more solar okay, than what it is now. Um, so they, they had a model of the whole solar plant hooked up with the power plants, the thermal power plants that they have, because they, it ought to be all integrated. But they, out of many, many variables, they have chosen only three variables for optimization. They thought that those are the three main parameters. One is the solar collector area. How much solar collector area, that means how many solar panels they should have. So total, an upper bound of 750,000 square meters. So you see how big they want it to be. They wanted to have that many, that big, okay? That's the upper limit. Then storage capacity. Once you develop the solar energy, you may, and if it's a sunny day, you may not be utilizing it. So you need to store it for evenings or rainy days or something like that. So how much storage capacity you need? Each one tank has eight hours of storage capacity. 
So if you want to do 8.1, you need to have some investment so that there is a second one. That's how you get the discontinuity in the problem, right? Because suddenly there will be a cost added. And then the third variable was the auxiliary boiler power. This is to have some other auxiliary way of getting the power in case the solar is not available. So how much to take from the traditional way? That is actually saying that. So just, just three, three variables here. Sometimes you think three variable, how, how difficult can it be? Okay. But it came to me with a lot of, uh, uns a lot of uh, complexities and practicalities that I would like to share with you because these are the important things from an industry. They sent me a manual of how they had come up with the objective functions and constraints. Okay. There are all these kinds of stuff, if then else statements. If this happens, do this, otherwise do that. So I realized the objective function and constraints are going to be a lot of discontinuities and all that will be there. Okay. So I asked them, okay, fine. Can you send me the objective function and constraint? And then that's where they had stumbled. They said, sorry, we cannot give it to you. Because they spend a lot of time developing it. That's their proprietary. Uh, it's their secret. They don't want to give it. So I said, if you don't give me objective function, how am I going to optimize? <laughs> okay. Because I can develop something on my own, but this may not fit your settings and, and all that. So they said, OK, one thing we could do is we could give you the executable. So everything is coded. They compiled it. So I cannot see what is there. I said, yeah, that will do. Because I know from previous experiences, I don't need to have a mathematical function. right? But all I need is a GA will create new solutions by um, crossover mutation. All I need someone to tell me how good are they. What is the objective function? What is the constraints? I don't need to know where it's coming from. You can come and say, touch it and say, this is the one I like or, or not like. Or you can, you can give me an executable. I just compute from it. So that's how the problem is. So these are called black box optimization, where you don't even know whether your function is convex or whatever it is, discontinuous or whatever. right? But here is the overall problem. They were trying to maximize profit. So it's a maximization problem. These are the variable bounds. And some of the constraint that they have, they don't even tell me. What are the physical meaning of the constraints? They said, well, everything the code will give. But I said, how many constraints? Because how many things I should take? I mean, this was the first time I was doing as if they don't want to solve the problem. But they still want me to solve it. Because they are not cooperative. And I realize that, first of all, it's another country to another country. right? They always have doubt what I'm going to do with it. And then the second is, they want to not disclose. I mean, as much they want to keep hiding from me. OK, so but then it's not a collaborative situation. But then you ask, they said, OK, what we can do, we can add up all the constraint violations and tell you if this is feasible or not. I said, I need a bit more information. Yeah, tell me if it's feasible or not. But if it's infeasible, tell me how much it is infeasible by. Because I need the constraint violation, the CV information, right? He said, yeah, we can do that. Because they are not telling me. What are the constraints? They are adding everything up. So there is no way I can you know, back engineer and figure out what are those things. So that was fine for them. So I cannot even write here what are the objectives, uh, sorry, constraints that they have. But all I have, some constraint value that was coming to me. If it's positive, that means violated. If it is 0, I know it's feasible. Okay. Before I did everything, I thought you know, somebody asked me, do you always try? And every problem I do with industry, I do this. Okay? I first try classical methods. So I have lots of classical software with me. So in this case, I thought with the problem formulation and the, sorry, the, the, the variables and the way the manual says, I thought it's a complex problem. So I've taken really good algorithms. And some of the variables are discrete. So uh, like branch and bound, this method has global adaptive random search, multi start global adaptive random Search, a constraint local search, the other one, simplex based solvers. It actually approximate me as the LP. Then there are interior point solvers, linear and quadratic. So there are all kinds of stuff in them. Okay? So we use these two softwares. And here are some snapshots. So I don't remember now which one is this. It's uh, Lindo, it says Lindo. Yeah. So when I use the Lindo for this, I, I give them, so they gave me one or two typical solutions. I said, if you can beat these solutions, that's what we're looking for. The somehow they have figured out some good solutions, right? So these are the three solutions they gave me. Hmm, come on, yeah, these are the three solutions. Sorry, these are the three solutions. 
this is the corresponding profit value. So I fit this as an initial solution. And seems to me the algorithm has improved a little bit. Okay? So I was happy that I don't have to go for GA. We can just give this. Then I tried with the second one. Now I optimize. And I thought if this is really the optima, if I start from this, I should get back the same design, same optimal solution, if there is one optima. But look at what I got. Okay? It's not even close. In fact, this one is, if you look at this, this is very similar to this, just slight changes. So whatever I'm giving it as initial solution, it's modifying a little bit on it and giving me back. OK. So when you get such a thing, you can think of two things. One is the algorithm is not working at all. It's just halfway doing something and giving you something back. Or there are multimodality. There are lots of multiple optima. Every time you give an initial point, it's just climbing its local hill and giving you that solution. The algorithm gets stuck, and that's what you've got. I don't know which is which. So I need to first find out what is the problem with this problem. Then we have LGO method I did. It actually did something very funny. I think there's something wrong in the algorithm, because it cannot happen. That every time we give something, it gives me back the same, same design, same solution. And sometimes it does, all the time, it does manage to reduce the profit. So I think I blame it to my student who did it probably didn't, or the code that we have was some problem in it. So because anyway, we thought we have to go for a GA or more investigation, we didn't invest much time to figure out what's going on with the code. OK. To investigate, what we do is we randomly create 10,000 points, OK? And then take the best of those values, profit, and the corresponding ACs. Then create another set of 10,000 points, best. I see that every time you create a set of 10,000 points, I get a completely different thing. This, this tells me, because I've not done any optimization here, right? It's just 10,000 and, and, and choosing the best one. Looks like there is a lot of multimodality, a lot of things happening in the search space. Okay? So then I did a systematic study. What I asked my student to do is take one of the variable, and just go in that steps, because this is, I think, one that has integer points on it, not every real. So he calculated on 700,000 to 750,000, I think, at the step of 1 or 10, I forgot now, and computed the function value and kept the other two parameters at some fixed value. I wanted to get an idea of the objective function. We have to maximize. Now you see this function? This looks like as we increase AC, my objective function increases, so the optimum is here. OK, it's very good. So then when you open this up a little bit, look at the nature of the function. It's massively multimodal. If you just go from 5 or 1, I don't know, remember the, the precision here. As we go, uh, this one also doesn't tell it, I think, too, too much to see. But yeah, but what ha whatever happening is there is a maxima. There is a local maxima you know, everywhere. So when I give one point, it climbs the hill and gets stuck there. When I give another one here, it climbs the hill and gets stuck there. So it goes on from here to there in the whole search space. So it's massively multimodal problem. It's not a job for a classical gradient-based methods, because you can get stuck in any of these places. You need an algorithm that will not look at these minor fluctuations. It will rather look at this global feature, that there is a global way to improve the function going towards right. An algorithm has to see it that way. And classical methods take it too seriously, every number when you're computing gradient, and that's the problem, right? Those methods didn't work. So here is my GA. I, I download from my website, rga.c, and I, their executable I hook it up with. I send the x. It sends me px, and whether it's feasible or not. And based on, I use this penalty function, penalty parameterless approach. Population size 50. I run it for 150 generations. And I get a design that is solution that is better than what they have given me. So here is, the, here is the performance. With generation number, this is the best one, improves. And this is the average of the population. And this is the classical means, whatever best we could find using slight improvement that we had or whatever they had given us. So you see, there is a, there is a big improvement from what they had given me and what, what GS could find. But now, I need to give them the software so that they can run it, right? So when you give something somebody, you should make sure that it's reliable. So I did 10 runs of my GA, and here is the fluctuation. 
Okay, so it started to happen in fourth uh, places here, fourth significant places here. And the solutions are not changing much. But I was not happy with it. I said, no, there's still a lot of fluctuation here. We need to try to do a little better than that. So then what we do, we change the GA a little bit. We say, okay, we're going to run 150 generations, get the current X star, whatever is the best now. Then at that 150th generation, every variable, I have a minimum and a maximum. I can actually find the standard deviation of the population. That's my sigma. Then I go plus minus sigma of the X star and reduce my bounds, lower bounds and upper bounds. So I restrict my search from there on. Run another 50 generations. I do it two times like that. Okay, And then we get a result. It is slightly better, 0.04% better than what I produced without this, the, the previous GA. So which is even better, right? But importantly, I make 10 runs now. And now look at where it's going. So four places is fine. This one is almost, because this is 967, and this is 1,000. So it's happening in few hundred euros level change, although we are talking about 2 million, right? This is 2, or this is what? 3, 3, 29 million is the profit of that the changes are happening at about 100, 100, 100 range. Is it 29 million, or did I do wrong? 3, 3, yeah, 29 million. And the changes are happening in 100, level 100. Not even 100, 67 to 18, so about 50, 50, 60. So that is really negative. That's actually 0.0017% difference in these results. So that's for all practical purposes are not two different solutions. I mean, 100 euros is nothing, right? So um, and you look at these values, There's, they are so close to each other. Now I feel confident that I can give it to them, and they don't have to run. 10 times, they can just run it once. But importantly, look at the results, because I published this result with their permission eventually. So one of the variables, if I try to look at my optimum and around it, look at the function. So this solution has two or three solutions, I think, right here. Okay, And if you cannot achieve these three solutions, you are bad right here. But there would be better solutions. But then since we are optimizing, we're every time you are finding that. So that's the power of GA. But is that a good thing for the point of view of, of practice? The answer is no. Because I don't know whether they will be able to achieve this exactly. So this was something I went ahead to them. I said, you know, I really optimized it. But here is the issue. Would you like to have a second part of the project where instead of finding this, we do this? But they said, no, we can handle from here. Okay, Because they, they, they know how to do uncertainty handling. So I said, fine. But if I had the second part, I would have not found this, but, but gotten this. I changed my algorithm so that it is. We'll talk about those uncertainty handling later. Okay? But I'm sh what I'm showing you here is the power of GA, that even such isolated optima, which is not supported by some intermediate points, you can still get there. This is another variable. It's a three variable problem, but I have all kinds of problems that I have been telling you beforehand in this three variable problem. One is the isolation. Second is discontinuity. This problem also is discontinuity. Like I told you, another tank has to be purchased, right? So when you come from left side, okay, there is some profit you get. When you come from the right side, the profit suddenly because this is the this is the cutoff point that you need another tank. So the cost, well, I mean this is here you need another tank. So the cost goes down in this case. The profit goes down, so cost goes up. Okay. Now if this is so let's say you have an objective function that goes like this. And like this, where is the optima? Where is the maxima of this function? Is it this point or that point? That point. So that point, is it not same as this point? No. No, no, it's not the same. Because this is slightly below this. Remember, it's a discrete search space. So this one is slightly below. So if you, if you make that little step, then you are going up. And that's the optima. So here, the optima is not supported from one side. Only if you come from another side, you get to the optimum. These are difficulties of optimization algorithm, which uses gradient. Because gradient, you need to have both sides supporting. right? Otherwise, there is no existence of it. This problem doesn't have a gradient. Gradient doesn't exist. Because it's not a continuous function. right? But GA is not a problem. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. When it comes to practically implement such a solution, only if you are No, that's not a difficult. All you have to do, make sure that you are never going below this. 
If you are, even if you are a little bit this side, you are not too bad, right? You can be somewhere here also and not too bad. Just have to make sure one side you are not going. So there can be lots of checks and balances. You keep that your variable doesn't go below this. Okay. But if it is in a place like both sides you have difficulty like this one, both sides you have difficulty, if you cannot achieve that exactly, then you are really bad on both sides, those are difficult to implement because you, there is no supporting solutions you have. Right? Okay, the third difficulty comes with the third variable where it's multimodal and also um, the optimalize on a constraint boundary. This is another issue with classical methods. But here, the optimal lies on the constant boundary. So my suggestion was, hey, why are you so hung up with 750,000? My calculation shows if you can increase this, you might get better profit, right? See, it looks like it's increasing. And it makes sense. If you have more collected area, you collected more power, so you'll make more profit, right? Uh, sometimes it may not happen. Sometimes the cost may not be effective to that point, but that hasn't reached yet. I think this may eventually go much more and then probably the cost is too high that it doesn't pay you back. So, so they are not even at that zone. So they can easily increase. So that they noted. They said, we note this, and we will see if we can increase it. Now, these are some things about the innovation and the knowledge that I was talking about. When you optimize and analyze the results, there are a lot of information stored in them, which can come on your way of improving the design from there on. Because this clearly tells us if they can go like another 50,000 square meter, they can improve, improve the profit by certain percentage also. So it's their decision. OK, I think we've gone past time. So, uh, so I'll stop here. I think this will allow us to come back and do the um, exercise problem. Uh, so we will be solving um, the exercise four, number two, only one problem. Because I've not talked about the theory, so I cannot do the next one. So we'll do one problem, and then we'll start the quiz. Okay? But as I said, quiz is not on two days. Two days lecture. It'll be last two days lecture. Okay. Stop now.